commissioners here. Okay. We'll wait a couple more minutes for more people to join. Okay, 702, we have a quorum. Why don't we get started? Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for the uh, ANC1C meeting uh, of June. Um, my name is Amir Irani, I'm chair of ANC1C and I also represent uh, single member district uh, 1C01, which is the southwest corner of Adams Morgan. Um, I'll ask my fellow commissioners to introduce themselves, uh, starting with 1C07, Commissioner Bowles. Greetings, everyone. My name is uh, Japer Bowles, and I'm the commissioner for 1C07. My pronouns are he, him, his. And 1C07 is the western side of the Reed Cook neighborhood, or essentially the entire eastern side of uh, 18th Street. Glad to be here and happy Pride Month. Thank you, Commissioner Bowles. I see a, a commissioner for 1C08 just joined, Commissioner Clem. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Fiona Clem. I serve as the commissioner for 1C08, which is in the southeast corner of Adams Morgan. Okay. Thank you, Secretary Clem. Um, going down the list, Commissioner Boots. Hello, everyone. I'm Commissioner for 1C06, which is the eastern edge, um, butting up against 16th Street, and then between uh, Telerama and Columbia with a little bit of Lanier mixed in for good measure. This is the Thanks, Commissioner Boots. Uh, Commissioner Gold. This order has completely confounded me. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Commissioner Zach Gold, 1C05. That is the northeast corner of Adams Morgan, uh, the border of Columbia Heights and Mount Pleasant with our lovely neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Gold. Um, Commissioner Faulkner. Hi, I'm Megan Faulkner. I'm the commissioner for 1C04, which is the um, northwest corner of Adams Morgan, the area surrounding Walter Pierce Park. Thank you. And Commissioner Wood? Hi, Peter Wood. I use he, him pronouns. I am in 1C03. It doesn't really make sense, but I like to think it was the landlocked one in the middle, <laughs> 18th to 19th, uh, Biltmore Twilight. Thank you. And uh... We, uh, Commissioner Carano is out um, this month. So uh, why don't we move on to the chair's report? Um, I just wanna say that uh, we have uh, um, the Adams Morgan Farmer's Market uh, starting back up uh, Saturday, June 5th. So that's this Saturday. Uh, it'll be in Unity Park. Um, I made this announcement last month, just run it by the community again, that the market will run from uh, 8.30 in the morning to 1 p.m. on Saturdays through Christmas. And parking around the park will be restricted from, my understanding is 5 a.m. until 3 p.m. on Saturdays so that uh, vendor trucks, so that it can make space for vendor trucks. So um, that's my only announcement uh, for this month. Um, and moving on to the secretary's report. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, as a secretary, I have nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Uh, Treasurer Faulkner. Uh, thanks. Um, our um, bank account balance is currently $13,922. Dollars and fifty four cents. Um, I will note that we did get one of our um, disbursements from OANC this month, um, and then also um, our three recent grants were cashed. So it's a big, a lot of change in the last month, um, uh, and that's all I have to report. Thank you, uh, Treasurer Faulkner. Uh, so let's go on to um, commissioner announcements. If you're chair of a committee, 
please do um, give a uh, go over your committee meeting agenda for uh, the coming month. And um, we'll start with uh, 1C08. Commissioner Klum. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of um, announcements. One is um, tomorrow is the 125th anniversary of the DC Public Library. So if you get a chance to stop by one of the neighborhood branches and, and you're one of the first 125 people at that branch, uh, you can get a swag bag, um, but it's just a, a nice way. And, there, and um, there's been so much construction over the last 10 years that it might be fun to get on a bicycle and go to a different neighborhood branch library because there are some beautiful ones in the system. I also wanted to share that Spacey Cloud is um, uh, hosting, uh, will be for the next five days, we'll be hosting a um, Black Lives Matter uh, photography exhibition called Rise Up. Um, it runs from uh, June 2nd today uh, through the 6th from 6 to 8 p.m. every night. And um, if you make a reservation, you'll um, get in a drawing for a um, photography gift. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clem. Why don't we just go right, right on down the list uh, numerically, so seven on down. Commissioner Bowles. Yes, uh, okay, so uh, real short and sweet for the ABC and public safety uh, meeting. I don't have any uh, new business, just our standing update from MPD 3D. Um, if I get any requests from commissioners or other, I'll report that. Um, and then in terms of personal, uh, or not personal, but commissioner news, uh, it is Pride Month. Um, and I know that since there has been re recent reopening, um, that it has been hard to plan around these things. So I want to give folks just a few, um, a few events. Um, to be aware of. First, uh, tomorrow at Pitchers from four to eight, uh, the mayor's office of LGBTQ fairs and DC Health and, uh, have teamed up to uh, give shots for shots, uh, essentially getting a vaccine um, and pitchers will also uh, offer an alcoholic beverage. Um, so if you haven't received your vaccine yet, uh, please uh, you know, do that and or look at the numerous other ways to sign up for vaccinations. Uh, the next event is uh, Capital Pride Parade. Uh, most folks uh, are, you know, used to the parade happening. Um, right now, the official is that it is just a Pride Mobile. Uh, however, there will be an announcement that it, there will be a walking parade. Um, so please put that on your calendar. It will be uh, all of that information will come out. Um, hopefully by the end of this week, but uh, there will be a walking parade, not just um, a car parade. Um, and then um, a personal event that I'm planning is a Pride Ride, uh, Pride Ride 2021. Um, it'll be with a few partners, uh, including Lime and Waba, um, Greater Greater Washington, the ANC Rainbow Caucus, and it'll be a fundraiser for HIPS, uh, which is a trans uh, dedicated organization. And uh, we are riding bikes and scooters uh, starting in Acostia Park and hopefully ending at Red Bear and uh, doing an LGBTQ and Black history uh, ride. So more information on that too. Um, but yay Pride events. Um, and that is all. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Bowles. Moving right on down, Commissioner Boots. Sorry about that. Having trouble unmuting myself. Um, not too many announcements um, from me, uh, but I did want to encourage everyone to um, take advantage of our reopening city. Um, visit those restaurants you may not have had a chance to go to yet, um, as we all hopefully are getting our first and second shots um, with the vaccine. You know, our local businesses and communities uh, really need us um, to to frequent them. So everything from the farmer's market to all the great restaurants and shops on 18th and Columbia, um, just, you know, come out there. Um, I've been happy to see how much traffic there is on all of those. And if you see me, um, please feel free to stop by and say hi. Thank you, Commissioner Boots. Commissioner Gold. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, the uh, I had a several DDOT related announcements, but fortunately we have so many representatives from DDOT here tonight to talk about visitors parking um, and other issues, so I don't need to raise those. However, I will uh, remind folks that the uh, 16th Street bus lane work uh, continues, uh, continues apace as far as I can tell, uh, and we should expect lane closures on 16th Street, especially around uh, Harvard and Columbia Road, Harvard Street and Columbia Road, and also up on Irving uh, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. during the week. Um, for updates on the 16th Street bus project, you can go to this website, which I've posted. Um, and uh, I, I, last I heard, and I believe they're on, um, on track, is that the uh, Columbia Road, Harvard Street, 16th Street intersection work will be completed uh, later this summer. Um, additionally, uh, one thing that I wanted to note is, uh, um, oh, sorry, this is, uh, this is related to the PZT committee, the Planning, Zoning and Transportation Committee. Uh, last uh, month, we had a really great conversation uh, about the DDOT's Move DC draft strategy plan. And I hope that all the folks on the line from DDOT, uh, including the acting director, will stay on the line to hear that conversation um, this evening uh, as we finalize that resolution. Uh, on the upcoming agenda um, for uh, next month, that is Wednesday, June 16th at 7 p.m., uh, the only thing currently on our agenda is to hear a request for a special exception uh, at uh, 2240 Ontario Road Northwest. Uh, but given that we have a lot of conversations going on tonight, uh, again, DDOT related, it's possible that we'll add some um, discussion to our PZT committee this month uh, from that. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Gold. Commissioner Faulkner, please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks everyone for all the great updates about Pride. And I know there's a lot of DDOT changes and fortunately we have a lot of <laughs> DDOT representatives here tonight. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, a couple of, uh, another um, ANC commissioner um, has put together a series of events called Sidewalk Palooza in um, to raise attention about um, pedestrian and bike safety issues in need of repair. Um, and um, get folks to enter 311 requests for those. Um, the information is not up on the site yet, which I will put the site in the link, but I am planning to do an event on Saturday, June 12th um, in our neighborhood. Um, I uh, just sort of put this together today, but I welcome other commissioners to collaborate and join, um, but just meeting at Walter Pierce Park um, and walking around um, the neighborhood, um, you know, just taking a look at the different pedestrian um, and bike safety issues. So I'll put the link to the Sidewalk Palooza website, but I will also be um, sending out, you know, exact time and details um, on the, the neighborhood listserv um, as well. Um, but just wanted to mention that. And that's it for me. So this is not the one that... Uh, Commissioner Wood, please. Uh, so uh, first, because Commissioner Caron wasn't able to be with us, just a quick recap from the PSC meeting last week, or yeah, last week, wow. <laughs> uh, we did a couple of things. One, we just heard from one of the grant recipients who's doing great work, Momentum Health. They're, they're awesome. I would recommend watching the video from the best two meetings just to get a more insight on what they do. And then also we discussed some of the text for one of the resolutions today on the budget recommendations. But the bulk of it was actually really fun because we had a panel on supporting survivors of domestic violence, which was if you have a good hour and a half to inform yourself, honestly worth listening and just kind of putting that on <clears throat> as you go. A lot of really good information. In terms of specific district stuff, I mean, there's a lot going on. I won't get into the details here because most of it's in the process of readjusting to an opening city with businesses trying to figure out what that means, with residents trying to figure it out. That also means a lot of people are littering again. I've just kind of tried to do a better job personally and in kind of like an organize, organized capacity of picking up more trash. Uh, hopefully have some more events on the horizon, but haven't gotten it quite firm yet, but there's a lot out there. Uh, and then also the platform of hope, they weren't able to be here because they have scheduling conflicts, but they asked me to share that this month they actually have an auction event. So I put the text in the chat the 24th to 28th, they're having an auction. They're a really good organization that's based out of Adams Morgan that does really important work. 
take a look at that, try to participate in the auction if you can. Uh, and yeah, it's been interesting to watch summer start. I, Memorial Day was fun because I didn't have any cars and their drivers start hitting me while I was biking. So hopefully everyone's having a similarly good experience. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Wood. Um, so um, uh, we have uh, Commander Kim uh, from the third district uh, on our agenda next, but um, I was just on the phone with him and unfortunately something came up so he won't be able to join tonight. Uh, so we will have him at our next ANC meeting, probably in July. Um, but you know, uh, the next person on our agenda is, uh, the director of DDOT. Director Everett Lott is here. Um, and, uh, if we can just promote him. Yeah, there we go. Uh, director Lott, please go right ahead. Commissioners, I want to say thank you for uh, having me here this evening uh, to speak on behalf of the mayor to present the mayor's budget for FY22. Uh, I'm joined here by a few of the DDI team members, as I'm sure you uh, have already realized. Um, but we have Cynthia Tercio, uh, Tercios, who is our Ward 1 Community Engagement Officer, who I'm sure many of you have worked with um, over the past many months. I'm also David Jones, who's our senior advisor, who has been the manager over the community engagement office for quite some time and has now moved into the director's office. He's also on the line. And also Sasha Carlisle, our uh, chief uh, administrative officer, is also on the line. So we do have a full army of DDOT team members on the call um, and we'll be happy to answer and address any questions that you may have. But I'm here really to talk today about the mayor's budget. And I believe Cynthia is going to, um, if we can allow her to share the screen, um, she is going to uh, put up the presentation that we have on the mayor's budget. All right. Thank you. And so we just first want to get started and let everybody know that, again, for the past um, 15 or 16 months, we've been in pandemic mode, responding to the pandemic, and that's all agencies, including um, DDOT. Um, I would like to say that for my team and, and the, the District's Department of Transportation, our team has been working full steam ahead from the beginning of the uh, pandemic up until present day. So many of our team members, many of our staff um, have not had a day off or have not um, been working from home, but they've really been out in the field the whole time. Um, but um, we've taken extraordinary steps um, to reduce our spending. Um, the pandemic has required us to make some adjustments in our spending. Um, we've had to access some of our reserves and maximize some of those, um, some of those resources. But all in all, um, the district, um, the DC's uh, district government, is their finances are really in good shape and in good um, position. And so um, one of the things that the mayor has often said, and I want to make sure I echo that, is that we are all in this together. Um, and as we work together, we will make sure that we continue to move forward and move the district uh, into a pay place of continued prosperity. And I do want to note, based on what Commissioner Bowles just said about the shots for shots, uh, we do want to encourage all of our um, folks who are listening on this call, watching this call, as well as all of our DC residents to please go out and get your vaccination shot. Um, the more people that get it, the better that we all are in the long run. So we are encouraging as many folks as possible to go get the shot. And if you are um, enticed by an, a shot for a shot, then I definitely would encourage you to do that. Um, sounds like a great opportunity as well. So we can move to the next slide. Should be slide three. Um, There you go. So I want to just talk a little bit about, um, again, kind of weathering the financial impact. Um, the district has balanced its budget for the past 25 years um, in a row and has a AAA bond rating. Um, the mayor's budget has, has leveraged federal funds and our strategic reserves to maintain our critical public services and invest in our residents' re resources and needs. And so um, our strong financial position and our prudent budgetary response has allowed us to avoid drastic reductions and drastic cuts. And if you all were watching the mayor's press conference um, as she presented her budget last year, or as she presented her budget today to the council, you will see that we have a pretty robust budget that we're able to build upon uh, for this upcoming year. We're really excited about that. Next slide. All 
And then this FY22 budget snapshot, um, this is the mayor's proposed budget, and it is growing by about 5.8%. Um, the district's growth is supported by about $561 million of federal funds, federal relief funds. And so, um, again, we have seen an increase where I think you may see other jurisdictions throughout the country where they may actually may be receiving reductions or having to go through some pretty drastic reductions in, in uh, resources and are possibly in personnel. But here at the district, we're not having to do that and really excited about what this budget has in store for us. Next stage. So the total budget uses, and this shows or illustrates our gross funds. Um, the mayor's gross funds uh, budget is about $17.5 million uh, and includes funds that supports our Medicaid, our Medicaid and Alliance programs, our schools, our parks and our transit infrastructure, as well as our critical public safety programs. So this just gives you an illustration of what that kind of looks like from an overall gross perspective, um, all operating funds by appropriation titles. Next slide. So the mayor's proposed budget um, proposes a $9.1 million in local fund spending. I mean, as you can see from this illustration, much of the funding supports our schools, um, both DCPS and our charter schools, and also the healthcare is a big recipient of a lot of the resources uh, and increases that you'll see for district residents. So education and healthcare and health res health related resources um, are where a lot of the resources um, went for this upcoming budget year. Next slide. So in our capital funds, um, the mayor is committed uh, to investments in improving the capital infrastructure of the district uh, and has proposed historic investments, which I'm really excited about um, in the district's Department of Transportation's infrastructure, um, as well as in our DC public schools, in our parks and recreation, in our facilities and our public works. And you'll see in some later illustrations where you'll see the, the, some of the increases in our infrastructure specifically for transportation. Now, the current public health crisis has required the district to use its reserve funds uh, to respond to the COVID-19. Um, the mayor's budget will replenish these um, by, the, by the end of uh, fiscal year 2024. And so you'll look, you'll see the cash flow reserves where we had to spend some of the cash, cash flow, and that's really just for being our everyday payroll type of expenses, um, our contingency cash, our fiscal stabilization, and the emergency reserve fund is one that has not been touched. Um, but again, by 2024, um, the expectation is that we will fully um, replenish um, all the reserves that we had to tap into uh, for this COVID relief efforts. Now, the mayor's budget makes strategic investments in the district's recovery um, using available or anticipated federal funding provided as a part of the American Rescue Plan. Um, this includes about $1.8 billion in state fiscal recovery funds and over $2 billion in direct aid to our hospitals, to our DC Metro, to our area businesses, um, tax credits and stimulus payments to individuals, um, unemployment insurance, and more. Next slide. Now, as we exercise our fiscal responsibility with these one-time stimulus funds, um, the Mayor, Mayor Bowser is investing in mobility, uh, transit equity, and our climate goals. Um, the mayor is also proposing relief to residents and businesses through job training, learning, and acceleration in business assistance. Um, the mayor is also doubling down on her investment in affordable housing with over $400 million commitment to accelerating our affordable housing goals. And we're still trying to reach our 36,000 uh, 36, new units by 2025. Um, additionally, through careful financial planning, the mayor is able to invest in critical programs such as our Homeward DC, our Building Blocks DC, and our alternatives to 911 response. Next slide. Now, Mayor Bowser's budget calls for significant funds to support our economic recovery, including about $486 million in investments, uh, for the economic recovery of our residents, 
um, and $427 million in economic recovery support for district businesses. Um, the mayor's budget also supports the district's health needs and our continued COVID-19 response. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the major areas within the, the budget. So uh, public education learning, as I had mentioned earlier, um, education and health resources, one of the two areas um, that receive the most attention and mo most resources in the FY22 budget. Um, one of the things we really wanna kind of highlight here is that the high impact tutoring for all DCPS uh, students, both uh, public schools and charter students is one of the main things that you'll see here. Um, this particular budget does also reflect a 3.6% increase uh, to the uniform per student funding formula. Um, and it also invest uh, in early child care and early childhood, uh, excuse me, early Saturday morning programming at parks and recreation facilities. So really excited again about the investments that the mayor um, and our full team uh, have put into education and health resources. And again, you'll see that throughout um, this presentation um, as we're going forward. In child care, there were stabilization grants that we supported and funded. Um, and these particular grants were extremely important uh, and allows for about 425 licensed child care centers to help mitigate the losses uh, that they experienced during the public health emergency. So really excited about here about this particular effort here that will allow for those child care centers to be able to replenish some of those resources. Um, we think that's a great opportunity for them to help to get back on stable ground. Next slide. Now we'll talk a little bit about our health care and human services. Um, there was increased funding here, as I had mentioned earlier, um, and continued support for five centers of excellence um, at Howard University Hospital. Um, affordable food access, which expands our, our produce and our uh, and the Nourishment DC Fund and increases senior meal delivery. Um, really excited about this particular, again, initiative in our health and human services category. Um, it supports over 736 small businesses, uh, which supports about 1,972 residents whose health insurance premiums are in arrears. So really excited about what we're able to do to help people get, again, get on stable ground. Next slide. Affordable housing uh, is extremely important to the mayor, extremely important to reaching her, our goal of 36,000 new units. Um, and there was a historic contribution that was made to the Housing Production Trust Fund uh, to create 2,800 affordable units, um, which will help us get to the mayor's goal of 36,000 new homes, um, 12,000 of them affordable by 2025. Um, with the 14,000 new housing units delivered since January of 2019, the district has reached almost 40% of that goal. So we're well on our way and really excited about the opportunities um, that this, this budget presents to help us to get and achieve that goal. Uh, rent and utility assistance also extremely important here. Um, and this will allow us to prevent the evictions through the Stay DC, which is a new program to provide financial assistance to DC residents. Next slide. Talking a little bit about public safety and gun violence prevention. Um, another 52 violent interrupters, 11 case managers, and six credible messengers to reduce gun violence. Um, these are some of the monies or some of the, some of the ways that these monies are being used to support uh, public safety and gun, violent, gun violence prevention. Uh, in addition, uh, one of the things that's really important in this particular program is that this budget includes 100 MPD cadets, funding for 100, 100 MPD cadets um, this program started a few years ago, and the really benefit of this program is that this does um, build through one through our, our public uh, school system, through our high schools. Um, so it is really directing the resources and the efforts towards uh, DC residents and trying to build the program through our local school system. And so, again, this particular budget, it has an increase of 100 MPD cadets that would go through the cadet program and then ultimately um, uh, as if successful, they will be sworn in as a sworn officer. So we're really excited again about this program. And the last thing here is that um, we have capacity that has been built into this particular budget to respond to non-emergency 911 calls for mental health uh, distress, for minor traffic crashes, 
and for parking complaints. Um, and those resources would be going to um, Department of Behavioral Health, to our agency DDOT, and also to the Department of Public Works. Next slide. As we talk a little about the economic recovery for residents, uh, again, this is extremely important to the mayor, um, really trying to help to make sure they're able to get um, our DC residents, our DC businesses back on stable ground. And I believe that we are well on our way to do that and position ourselves uh, in such a way that we are able to do that. Um, but this particular um, slide kind of illustrates the, our cash assistance for those who don't qualify for federal unemployment. Um, we also will be providing laptops, tablets, and smartphones for all of our seniors, our youth um, exiting foster care, uh, our families rolled in TANF, and also for returning citizens. So really making an investment in, in these pick areas to help people to provide them with the necessary foundation and hopefully the necessary resources uh, to be able to, again, to enter back into the, the workforce uh, or enter into some place of stabilization um, uh, as we're going forward in the new year. Next slide. One of the things you'll see here in this particular slide is the increased funding for our great streets. Uh, this, this is increased the funding for our inclusive, innovative uh, equity impact fund, um, our commercial ownership opportunities for small businesses and a bridge fund for our arts venues. I'm really excited about this particular program. And I think one of the things you'll see um, is that we're talking about some of our great streets um, initiatives um, and our main streets initiatives. Um, many of you may be familiar with the main street initiative or excuse me, open streets initiatives that we did on Georgia Avenue a couple of years ago. And we're looking at doing something similar uh, again in uh, the upcoming fiscal year, but also doing some smaller uh, uh, type of main streets in some of the local neighborhoods, including on 18th Street. Now, this is my slide, transportation and the environment, and I'm really excited about the increases that we are uh, that we saw here in our budget this year. Um, we have roughly about three hundred fifty one million dollars um, that are being dedicated to our streetscapes, our trails and our Vision Zero program. And this includes the DuPont Crown um, deck over and also uh, the new South Capitol Street um, trail to the National Harbor. Um, also, we have about one hundred and sixteen million dollars that's being invested for the K Street Transit. Uh, which will provide, uh, in addition to uh, improving our headways and our buses, um, but provide protected bike lanes and, and through the downtown corridor and the downtown area. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have roughly about $9 million to reclaim what we call our public, uh, reclaim our streets for, our, for public use. And this is one of the areas I was mentioning a little bit earlier on the last slide before um, about um, our open streets, where we had it on Georgia Avenue a couple of years ago. Um, we're looking at doing another one on Georgia Avenue and on 7th Street, but then also having some of these mini closures um, or mini open streets, uh, 18th Street being an example of one of those locations um, that we're looking at doing that. Um, in addition, a couple of things that this particular budget will offer related to transportation that I'm really excited about is that this will allow for an additional 80 new capital bike share stations. Um, so that every resident has a, a station within about a quarter mile of or his or her home. Um, it's going to also allow for us to invest in about 35 new uh, electric bikes uh, for the bike share fleet, which I'm extremely excited about. And then also we're going to be pilot piloting about 20 of our, our bikes for adoptive bike share type programs for, for people who are living with some type of disability. So I'm really excited about that, really trying to make sure that we're providing access to reliable transportation um, to everyone. Um, throughout the district. And so we feel like this particular budget allows us to, to do that and, get, and helps us to achieve this particular goal. And then just a couple other things I'll kind of point out on this particular slide. Um, the mayor's commitment to our, our bicycle infrastructure was really evident and shown in this particular budget here. As you may recall, the mayor has um, uh, uh, um, made the goal of 20 miles of protected bike lanes by the year 2022. And we are well on our way to achieving that now. But she has doubled up and really doubled down, I guess I should say, on that investment by offering now 30 miles, um, 30 new miles of protected bike lanes over the next three years. Um, and so we're really excited about what this is going to do for the district in terms of the connectivity, in terms of our bicycle infrastructure, and in terms of, again, making more accessibility uh, in terms of people who choose to use our bicycle infrastructure as a mode of transportation. 
And then the last thing, um, this particular budget, um, we've been on a major uh, pavement initiative for the past many years and really trying to make sure that our roads are in a state of good repair. And so by the year of 2025, we're estimating that all of our streets, our sidewalks and our alleys will be in a state of good repair. And again, that's by the year of 2025. So I'm really excited again about the investments that were made here in transportation um, between our capital uh, portfolio and our local budget. Um, we're really um, planning and expecting to do some really great things in this upcoming year. And so um, really excited for those things to come. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, ah, okay. Let's have a couple more slides and then we'll be done. All right. Uh, a couple more. So um, capital improvements. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about this. Um, this particular our capital improvements fund will allow us essentially to modernize about 40 um, of our uh, either modernize, expand or renovate about 40 of our schools, um, including um, Amadon Bowen, uh, the Drew King, the Brent, LaSalle, Bacchus and the Starry Elementary Schools. Um, and this also, these resources in the capital improvement budget will also allow us to replace the H Street Bridge, which is right over by Union Station, which will allow us to improve the safety and the support to Union Station, especially the Union Station redevelopment um, and the expansion of the high-speed rail that goes in and out of DC. And so we're really excited about the capital improvement investments that you'll, that you'll see here in this particular budget. Again, many of those investments and improvements also go to transportation, which we're ex extremely excited about. So that wraps up the mayor's budget. Um, I did have, if uh, council chair, uh, excuse me, uh, ANC chair, if I have the time, I was going to talk about some specific things that are in essentially the Ward 1 budget, um, but I'll uh, leave that to you to make that determination if we have the time to do that or not. Yes, certainly. And then, uh, um, of course, take questions specifically about 1C. Uh, I know that there's a whole list and uh, we have uh, Cynthia also on the line to help with that. So we certainly have time for it. This is a... Yep. Uh, a big agenda item for us. Sure, and this will be quick. Um, so again, just to kind of specific and narrow it down to, to Ward 1 investments um, and kind of break this up into categories um, in housing and economic development opportunities. Um, the mayor's budget, this proposed budget for FY22 uh, proposed to invest about $24 million in the redevelopment of the Reef Center right there at 14th and U. Um, about $5 million is, is invested to design the redevelopment of the district owned property at the corner of the, or at the 600 block of, of U Street Northwest, which I believe is the old uh, police precinct. And then lastly, under some of the housing economic opportunities, $14.8 million to redevelop the Park Morton Housing Authority um, site as part of the new communities initiative. Um, as we talk about education and communities, um, here are some of the specific investments again in Ward 1. Uh, $59 million for the Adams Educational Campus, um, the uh, modernization and renovation uh, project, excuse me, $70 million for the Tubman uh, Educational Campus, which also is a modernization and renovation project. And then lastly, um, $4 million for capital repairs and upgrades at Cardoza um, ed Educational Campus. And then a couple of things in transportation. Again, these are just a few things and, and definitely not all inclusive, um, but transportation and the environment, um, construction of our bus only lanes. Um, and this is um, uh, for a bus priority treatment on Columbia Road, Northwest between 16th Street and California Street. Um, about $1.7 million is being proposed for the U Street landscape between 14th and 18th Street Northwest. And then uh, roughly about $25 million for our local street paving. And that is a number that's cumulative, not just for, um, for Ward 1, but for the city as a whole. And then just last couple of things um, as I'm wrapping up, uh, the investments in our health and public safety. Um, so again, $25 million for the Shaw Howard University Hospital Infrastructure. Um, about $5.8 million is proposed for um, a school-based mental health expansion program. Um, about $3 million for neighborhood-based senior socialization hubs, which um, are senior centers, which would allow for our seniors to be able to have a place to gather safely. Um, and be able to have some socialization outside of their homes. Um, $2 million to create um, what we're calling a new sobering center um, to divert lower risk cases from some of our crowded uh, emergency rooms. Uh, and then the last couple of things, about $250,000 for um, another annual maternal infant health summit. Um, and then about $170,000 to support dementia training for our direct care workers. So that gives you a, a, a brief overview 
um, from public safety through transportation to education to housing and economic development, uh, some of those investments that would be specifically geared towards Ward 1. And so um, really want to, again, thank everyone in the, in the commission for your time and um, myself and as well as the full team are here to answer any questions that um, the commission or others may have. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mayors. Uh, budget jump to so we have a lot of uh, concerns, uh, uh, issues, both um, sort of unresolved uh, throughout ANC One C, uh, DDOT related items, and uh, happens to be we also have a, uh, a fairly detailed resolution uh, providing feedback on the draft Move DC uh, update for 2021, um, along with. Uh, having just completed a walkthrough uh, of ANC1C um, with uh, Cynthia Tercios from DDOT, uh, we're, we were able to put together a pretty comprehensive list um, of uh, concerns. And what we, what I don't wanna delay further is just uh, get to uh, some of those concerns, some of those questions. Um, and I'll start with uh, the chair of our, uh, PZT committee, Commissioner Gold. So go right ahead, Commissioner Gold. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lott, for that presentation. I, I'll start um, small. Uh, you noted in your budget presentation, and it was a very thorough presentation, but you noted that uh, there is funding and a plan for bus only lanes on Columbia Road from 16th to California. Uh, that is awesome. Um, you know, something that we definitely need to move transit uh, faster and more efficient through our community. Uh, that being said, you should know uh, that this ANC, both our predecessors in 2019 and this current ANC in February of, two, of this year, uh, requested a protected bike lane on Columbia Road from uh, 16th Street to California Street. And so I was wondering um, if you could elucidate a bit on how a uh, protected bike lane uh, could fit in with a bus only lane or how that bus only lane will uh, impact the uh, ability to have a protected bike lane on Columbia Road. Uh, I'll start there, thank you. Sure, and Commissioner, I appreciate the, the, the question. I and mean, usually when we do a, a bus only lane that is uh, a shared space for bus and bike, um, and, and, and on Columbia Road specifically, I think just the width of the roadway um, would not allow and support both uh, the protected bike lane as well as uh, 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 the bus lane or the car free lane. So um, what we did opt to, and you will see this throughout some areas within the district where we do have a car free lane um, that does include and allow for, um, for bicyclists to, to travel. Great, thanks. And I would only ask that when, when that is implemented, that it be a 24 seven uh, bus bike lane, because I know that if there's a, if some of the bus lanes are only during rush hour. Um, and that would mean that during the uh, no other hours, there would be zero facility for bikes. So I pushed uh, to make sure that that was a 24 seven lane, recognizing complications that um, DDOT will have to work out with curbside management. Um, a, a broader question I have about this budget you presented, um, there was a, a glaring omission, and that was the $41.7 million necessary to fully implement the 2020 Vision Zero Act. If Mayor Bowser is committed to Vision Zero, if the transportation is, uh, safety is your number one priority, why doesn't the mayor support funding the Vision Zero Act? Yeah, uh, Commissioner, I think one of the things that you'll see in this particular budget um, is that, you know, and one of the things we've talked about um, as an agency um, is that Vision Zero, from our perspective, is just the label and the title, but it's safety. And that's what we do is safety. And so what you'll find in our particular budget, um, we received a 19% increase in our overall budget um, and everything that we're doing um, for transportation relates to safety. And so even though you may not see in terms of the 41.7 that you're talking about specific, specifically, um, you will see the overall investments for safety throughout our overall budget and the projects that we're moving forward. And so I am excited about this budget. Um, I believe the efforts that we have, um, the efforts that we already have made, um, the investments that we are making and that we will make will definitely allow us to continue to increase safety along all of our roadways for all roadway users. Great. Well, on, on that point, um, and I'll just have a couple more questions. I'll leave it then to my colleagues. 
So last year, there were 37 traffic fatalities in the district, but your department only published 13 fatal crash follow-up memos. Uh, not a single memo was published in 2021, despite there already being 17 traffic fatalities on pace for the most deadly year on district roads since 2007. What data does DDOT collect on traffic fatalities? And will you commit to publicly sharing these reports once again under your tenure? If DDOT doesn't collect data, how can it determine ways to mitigate uh, and vary the, the crash uh, issues that contribute to these crashes and, um, and stop future crashes in similar road configurations? Commissioner. Right. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just, you know, you mentioned that your team has been working full steam ahead during the pandemic, and I appreciate the awesome hard work that your team is doing. But during the pandemic, there has been no reporting on crashes, and there has been a backlog of traffic safety um, uh, assessments. So those, the, the, those backlogs and lack of reporting don't square with a, a team that's been working full steam ahead. So a couple of things. One, um, we, we are still maintaining in, in, uh, data, and we work very close with our partner, sister agency, MPD, um, on that information. And so we are working uh, in collaboration with MPD as we're working to gather and collect data. And so that information is being collected. Any fatality that has happened on our roadways um, between MPD and our agency, that, is, that information is being gathered and collected. Um, as you reference our, our traffic safety assessments, one of the things that um, I will share with you and the, those on this call that may or may not be aware um, is that that is a service that we actually contract out with the, tra the, the TSA process. And so again, as I had referenced and mentioned that our staff, um, the 1,100 employees that work for DDOT have been working uh, very tirelessly every day during the pandemic and will continue to do that post pandemic. Um, those traffic safety assessments, I think, you know, I think all processes, businesses um, and functions throughout, I think, you know, most sectors, whether it's business, um, government, um, nonprofit, I think we all saw some, um, you know, um, slowing down of, of productivity because of the pandemic, but did not stop us from continuing to move forward and work. Um, but that also did impact our the ability to have those traffic safety assessments completed, who were again contracted from an outside resource. One of the things I have noted, though, because I am aware, um, I was a resident of district uh, for DC for 20 years before taking this job. And I am aware of the process and also was a, a former ANC commissioner, two-term ANC commissioner. So I'm very familiar with the whole TSA process. And I am very familiar that that process does take too long, regardless of who's doing it, whether it's a, uh, an outside entity or whether it was us in-house doing it. And so one of the things that the team has been looking at and has been working is to revamp that whole process. And some of the things that are more um, things that we can actually do in-house, we're going to start taking those things in and doing those ourselves. Um, and those things that could really be done, what I'm calling as a quick fix item, um, those things are things that we will do and address so we can immediately get out and respond and take care of it, as opposed to um, taking that over to the outset firm that does those TSA. So you will see some improvements um, through that process. You will see um, those improvements, which will allow for us to be able to respond a lot quicker in terms of providing the service that, you know, in your case, you may be asking for or for your residents um, that you're servicing. Great, thank you. Um, uh, just for, for our uh, ANC, and we'll be asking for this in our resolution on Move DC, we're really keen that the data that you collect is publicly shared. It used to be publicly shared. It would be great if you continue to publish. There hasn't been a Vision Zero Progress report since 2016. Progress has not been made in that time, and so we would love to see a Vision Zero Progress report in 2021. And with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back uh, my time. Thanks, Commissioner Gold. Thank you, Commissioner Gold. Other commissioners, uh, you have questions? Um, Commissioner Bowles. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Director Lott, uh, for your time today. Definitely appreciate it. And uh, welcome uh, to being uh, in leadership and getting all of these questions. You're definitely used to it by now. Um, so <clears throat> I guess, I I don't I, I don't really have any questions. I think at this point it's more of like a comment and like a continued 
push. Um, you know, we're looking to make Adams Morgan more uh, pedestrian and cyclist friendly. Um, there are statistics that show that this type, these types of improvements brings more uh, money to the neighborhood. And, you know, obviously we have the 18th Street and Columbia Corridor. Um, so we not only have residents, but also businesses behind opening up streets uh, for um our neighborhood and that comes in such big things as like the 18th street pedestrian zone which i would love if you could just give us a brief update on that um but also with smaller things just like bump outs at intersections and um, the traffic study assessments uh, process. Um, I'm glad that there is a process, but it's kind of a terrible nightmare. And it seems like you already know that as well. Um, it takes so, 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 so long for any improvements to be made just way too long. And I don't know if that means you guys need more money. If you, I, I don't know what that means, but it is, it's too long. Uh, it takes too long to do anything. So, um, you know, I'm in support of a lot of the things that the mayor's budget proposes. We're definitely not doing enough in this space. And again, like, I don't know, <laughs> um, you know, that's the council, you know, they can try to do and uh, try to um, close the gaps as much as they can, but there's just no possible way. And I really feel like the mayor could lean in hard here. And I just, the $5 million to purchase cameras, I don't want, I don't want cameras. I want bump outs. I don't want people, I don't want black and brown people to be getting ticketed. I want them to not have an opportunity to park illegally. And I want them to be able to get to and from my neighborhood safely. And it's just, Cynthia came to chat with us and, or not chat to do a walkthrough. And I honestly like said, we don't even need to go through my single member district because it will take so much of her time. And we only did the Northern part of our neighborhood. There's just, yeah, there's currently 20 open traffic safety assessments in one C and we just need more love here, director lot. We need more love. Um, there's numerous things we could do really quickly, just bump outs, um, you know, allowing us to have the pedestrian zone um, and getting some of these traffic safety assessments uh, funded and uh, our traffic patterns changed based on that. So um, if you could just give a brief update on, uh, or if you have any updates on the 18th street, that'd be awesome. Thank you for letting me listen, or for listening to my rants. Uh, we just need more attention and please, what can we do to get more attention here? Um, and thank you for coming, I appreciate it. Not a problem and Commissioner Bowles, I, I feel your pain and I can, I can hear your pain through your, through your, your um, voice uh, about the TSA process. And again, I just wanna reiterate um, I recognize it is a challenge. Um, I recognize it again, long before I became the director of DDOT um, as a resident, as a former ANC commissioner, I get it. And again, one of the things that the team has started looking at probably about a couple months ago is revamping that process um, again. And so I, I do feel very confident that what you will find and what you will see as we roll the new process out, um, it will be a major improvement in terms of our time frame for being able to turn um, around and provide a, a service based on whatever is being asked for. So um, you'll see that we'll be rolling out in the next couple of months. Um, they're kind of fine tuning it now, but it is something that we've been working on uh, for the last couple of months. And so I feel very confident that you'll see a, a, a completely different process um, that will allow for it to be a lot more efficient and a lot faster in terms of our responsiveness. Um, we still will be using the contracted service um, um, and they will be doing some of the longer term, bigger projects. Um, and so, and some of those things do require us to be able to take a holistic approach because one of the things that we do want to do and some of those type of things is we want to make sure that we're looking at a year round because we don't want to do uh, an analysis as an example uh, when school is out because the traffic flow, the traffic patterns when maybe schools are out will be different from when they are in. And so we want to make sure we're looking at a holistic approach. So, so some of those bigger initiatives that you or others may be asking for those still would require the normal TSA process that we're doing now, but some of the smaller things, bulb outs, um, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, speed bumps, things like that, we're not gonna go through a TSA process for those type of things. Those things we'll be able to do in-house. So um, we're working on that. I would ask Cynthia if maybe she has an update she can share with you to your question about the 18th Street pedestrian zone.
Cynthia, you're able to unmute yourself. And of course, like you can come back to that too. That's not a, but that's definitely something we are interested. In. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, can you hear me? Technical issues all evening. Um, are you all able to hear me? Um, you're coming in a little, uh, you know, shaky, and uh, but you know, you you could try. Go right ahead. Okay. Well. I, I don't want it call scheduled later on to touch base on the concerns committee to touch base with you on that later on and then all uh, transportation meeting later this month on uh, our walk and um, other I have so I don't get cut out on here if that works with the commission. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We can go over that uh, at the uh, PZT meeting on the third Wednesday, if that's what you're saying. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, and Director Lott, thank you, Cynthia. Um, Director Lott, you know, I just, uh, when it comes to uh, some of these changes, like a bulb out or, you know, um, there are some things that can be done that are a lot faster, like painting um, the road as it would resemble a bulb out around uh, near a crosswalk. Um, you know, these kinds of, this kind of, uh, I think, innovative feedback was given before, but it's just to me, um, having been on the commission uh, for a few years, there seems to be a, the general theme that I see is just a, uh, DDOT to me comes off as a black box or sometimes, and it's not a criticism, it's just an observation. And that um, if that could be changed, uh, I think it'd be helpful for, you know, every ANC, every community member, uh, you know, we come up with this idea, we understand that it's different to pour concrete and create a bulb out, right? Than it is to just paint the road near it and not, and when I say paint the road, we, I also understand that you, know, you can't, paint the crosswalk itself, right? Because those have specific uh, uh, ways that they're supposed to look, but you know, what does it take to get something like that done? And how soon can these things be done? We requested high visibility crosswalks on Columbia Road. When, when could we expect some of these things? Well, uh, if you have a specific location that you may be inquiring about, then we can definitely, I can give you some specific answers or at least um, follow up with you with some specific answers. But in general, one of the things I really want to share and really impress upon all of you um, on the commission and those who are listening in is that, um, you know, I recognize that there, and hopefully you all recognize that there are processes, we are the government, um, and that requires us to go through various processes. So, you know, we're having to go through procurement and contract some of these services out. Um, we're having to go through and, and looking at the, the cost estimates from different uh, vendors that we may be working with. So those things also take time. And then we have to get this thing scheduled. And so, and, and so that's just a piece of it um, that does, um, you know, that people may not recognize or think that, hey, we can just kind of go out, get the request today and go out tomorrow. Uh, and some things we may be able to do that, but there are many things that really does require us to have to go out and, and, and get the, the bids. Um, get the design, create the design, make sure there aren't any conflicts in the roadway um, under the ground um, before we actually do some things like that. So it, it is a little bit more involved than what people may realize. Um, but at the end of the day, the message is uh, received loud and clear in terms of the overall timing that it takes. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, again, my chief operation officer, Howard Ways, um, my chief of project delivery, Ellen Jones, um, that they are both working on to make sure that they're improving and cutting out any of the administrative uh, areas that is cause it to be further delayed or further slowed down. So we're working on it. Um, I hear you, but I do also just want to reemphasize that there are some, some administrative things that are, are absolutely required and necessary um, that we have to do. And because of that, it does somewhat um, take a little bit longer than what people may actually wish for. Absolutely. And uh, I completely understand that. And um, I think you know, just some sort of uh, feedback along the way. Sure. Uh, totally understand things take time, um, but moving, uh, giving that feedback, time it takes is fine. So long as we know the ball is moving in the right direction. Um, yeah. And then on 18th street, it's just something that uh, I have worked on 
personally for a few years and um, also we've worked uh, as a community uh, very closely uh, with the bid and uh, businesses and community organizations in providing uh, health and safety plan. More recently, uh, we've had weekly, sometimes bi-weekly meetings um, with district government. Uh, do you have any uh, more specific update, a more substantive update on 18th Street and the closing timeline? Well, well, I'm not sure. Are you referencing the the open streets that I mentioned in the budget presentation? Um, I don't know if open streets is the right way to describe it, but I am referencing uh, what we want here in Adams Morgan of the weekly street closure. Uh, what we've been aiming for uh, is a weekly street closure on the weekends. So if that's the open streets, then that's exactly what I'm referencing. Yeah, so I think it's, I think they're, Two different things, a little, little different, but uh, let me just talk a little bit about, um, again, in the mayor's budget, one of the things that um, she did put in there is essentially reclaiming the public space. Um, and when I say open streets, and there are there are monies that have been designated for um, an open street concept in each ward, and 18th Street is one of those um, streets in your particular uh, ward that has been designated for that. And so we'll be working with, with you know, the commission, with the um, with the bid to kind of as we're you know to try to see what that ultimately looks like the monies will be invested for our uh, put in the budget for 2022 so we'll be working with you all closely to figure out what that looks like but there are monies that have been set aside um, whether that's you know closing on the weekends whether that's a, a one day event those are things that we'll need to work out over the course of um, the next several months as we're trying to roll this out um, but those monies have been committed. Um, based on the mayor's proposed budget, which I think is getting us and moving us in that direction for where I think you and others may want to see it go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, some follow-up questions, but I don't want to take up too much time. Maybe we'll do that offline. Uh, I do want to get to other questions, and um, I see Commissioner Wood has his hand up, and then Commissioner Boots. Yeah, I'll be brief because I think most of my thoughts have actually been said by this point, but I mean, just kind of re reiterating what has been said, uh, I think that there's kind of like a collective sigh of relief when we learned you're going to be here tonight because <laughs> DDoT's important to us and we love you guys. And like you were saying, there's a lot of things that are kind of no specific person's fault, but like communication and I don't want to necessarily call it transparency, but in some cases it is questions of transparency makes everyone's job easier. Of course, ours is unpaid, but we're still here for you. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we'll see, yeah, so some of those points have been addressed just to make that better. But like, I get, I guess it's getting to the point where people like almost every day on the street are asking me either about specific, very hyper-specific uh, street issues or about the 18th street closure. Uh, and yeah, people, I mean, I think a lot of that can be alleviated by just making more streamlined channels of communication so that especially so the residents and also commissioners <clears throat> really don't feel as left out of the loop. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's a matter of educating the sources that are available. But uh, I think that's really important because we have a really, uh, from what I can see, we're a good group this year. <clears throat> but also like when we talk about the timeliness and lack thereof of projects, it's hard because from the ANC's perspective, a lot of things work on kind of an ANC the election cycle, which is in many cases significantly shorter than the amount of time it takes to get something done. So that kind of, uh, that difficulty can not be a big deal if the neighborhood kind of has cohesiveness in terms of what different commissioners and districts want, but sometimes that becomes a challenge. So I know it's impossible to completely resolve, but really just yeah, reiterating that we're really, ha at least I'm happy that you're you know, willing to take time to talk to us and hear about this, because it seems like you're really interested in one, listening to people like us, and also kind of th without the district, or through the context of the district, you know, we're not the only neighborhood but also when you consider specifically how many people work, live, uh, come here to visit the parks, to our patrons of the restaurants. One of the few neighborhoods where transportation is especially heightened because it's crucial to the whole city because there's really so much flow of multimodal transportation. So I'm usually the first person to say, okay, let's make sure that we're not the, taking the, hogging the attention from the rest of the city. But I think in this case, we really do have an important place in the lives of you know, people throughout the districts today. Thanks for, I know there's a lot more work ahead always, but I appreciate you being willing to do that with us. Thank you, Commissioner, really appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Boots. 
Um, I'd also just like to reiterate how great it is to have you here and that it's been really refreshing um, to hear your answers. Um, my question is actually on the residential permit parking. And I know that's administered by a number of different parts of uh, DC government, but hopefully you can answer uh, my questions or at least direct me to it. Um, as there's been a lot of attention to the increase in the, the permit parking, um, one thing I wanted to get a little bit more clarification is, and the, is the amount of houses that have multi-permits, especially in our ANC. Um, so um, I think uh, one way to kind of reduce the traffic is to use an incentive, um, is to make it either more expensive or harder to get um, more than one parking permit for your cars. And I know that there are some residents who definitely need multi-cars in their house, but I think in this house, this neighborhood, I would hopefully um, that would be a low. Um, but I guess my real question is just what's the breakdown between amount of people who have one permit versus um, those uh, residents that have multi-permit and kind of what's the, the philosophy and what's the, the reasoning um, that we make it pretty easy to get more than one parking permit per residential house? Um, Commissioner, I do not have an answer, and I'll, we'll see if we can get that answer for you in terms of the breakdown um, for households that have one versus multiples. Um, I don't have that information, um, but we'll see if we can, that's something we can get and pr um, provide to you um, after this call. Um, you know, one of the things I do want to highlight is that on uh, we are piloting right now our, our what we call the, v, the VPP, our visual, vi, Visitors Parking Program, um, and we're piloting that in a digital format. Um, once we complete that pilot um, and, 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 and work out all the kinks, then we are going to be able to ultimately roll out um, our residential parking um, program as well and hopefully have that digitized. Um, and, you know, we are looking at, um, you know, the, the single use versus uh, our single household versus the multiple use household in terms of number of permits. Um, and that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, but I really don't have an answer for you right now, but that's something we'll have to try to follow back on with you. Um, after this call, and we can provide that to you. Cynthia or, or David can provide that information to you after this. Great. Uh, Commissioner Faulkner. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Rani. Um, I just wanted to echo a lot of what everyone has said. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And also just um, in particular, um, I think the, the transparency about, you know, sort of um, how long TSAs take and when they are in progress and about other projects in the timeline is I think um, a big um, part of, um, you know, people's frustration sometimes is that, um, you know, I know I'm a new uh, commissioner and, you know, figuring out how to get information and from who can often be very difficult of like, how do you know if a TSA has been begun or where it is in the process? Um, and so I just would say that I think um, a, a fair amount of, you know, not all of the frustration is just about that transparency, but I think a, transparency about timelines, about how things are going, about how to get information um, would really, you know, DDOT is the, the DDOT related projects or, or um, things in DDOT's purview are the thing I hear from constituents the most about. Um, and so I just want to be able to, to give them, you know, accurate and updated information, which can be really hard to get. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that. Thank you for your time and joining us. Absolutely, Commissioner. One of the things I do want to note um, is that we have um, a dedicated community engagement um, officer for each ward. Um, Cynthia uh, Tercios is our community engagement officer for this particular ward. And so I know she makes herself available and accessible um, to all the ANCs throughout the ward. Um, and goes on multiple site visits. I've gone on a couple of site visits with her in the past couple of months as well. Um, so we will make ourselves available to each and every one of you, but um, Cynthia will definitely be your first point of contact. Um, and, you know, I, I tell, I've told Cynthia as the rest of our community engagement um, team members um, that I like to get out as much as possible. It makes it a lot easier and better for me to be informed and make decisions when I actually can see things from a, a, a on the ground perspective. And so the more I'm able to get out, the better. And so um, I'm happy to get out and meet with e you and each and, and each and one of you um, and, and your constituents that you all represent in your single member districts. Um, but again, I just really want to emphasize that, that Cynthia is that main point of contact and she has a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of information to be able to share with you. Um, again, she may not be able to give you a specific answer about how long a TSA is going to 
to take because each TSA would be different. But as we're going through the process, as I've shared with the other commissioners um, of revamping and redoing our whole TSA program, um, that process is going to be improved and it is going to allow us to be a lot more responsive and a lot more timely in terms of the interventions that we're able to put in place. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Faulkner and Director Lott for that. Um, before we uh, uh, circle back around for any second questions, I do wanna get to uh, people who have been waiting to ask a first question. So uh, we have uh, first on the list, Nick Rowland, go ahead. Uh, good evening, this is uh, Nick Rowland with the uh, Recook Neighborhood Association. Um, as uh, the commissioners mentioned, and as we've talked extensively about traffic studies, um, there's 20 in Adams Morgan that are open and 10 of them are due next week. Do you know if you're going to be able to deliver on those 10 next week? Um, I'd have to go and look and I'll have Cynthia. She would have my, probably more information about those specific 10 or those uh, 20. So I'll ask her to um, look and she can share that back with the commission. Um, if I can chime in, I'm not direct a lot. Um, but I will be sure to see meeting with our safety team tomorrow to get those TSAs. So as soon as I have the, we'll be sure to touch base with the Reed Cook Mill as with the appropriate commissioners um, at ANC 1C. Awesome. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Hey, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, and uh, just as a, uh, I've been told that it's just a follow-up to Commissioner Faulkner's question. It's not a, a new business. Commissioner Gold, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank Cynthia for her hard work while uh, Mr. Law is here. Um, but but honestly, uh, you know, going back to Commissioner Faulkner's comments about transparency, and uh, it, it, it's not just between Cynthia, it's also Cynthia and every other office of DDOT. So Cynthia can be very responsive and, you know, she'll, she'll the same day that I send a very long email say, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And then what goes on inside the department of whether or not she's getting any feedback from those different um, uh, projects, whether it's individual projects or the safety team or the vision zero team or the bike team or the bus team or the freight team, uh, you know, so uh, I really, we do appreciate her hard work and we, you know, we wish there were more Cynthia's, but but that also requires uh, an engaging uh, staff inside DDOT who will be able to provide information to her that, that she can then liaise to us. That's all I needed to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Gold. Uh, Helen Walsh. Oh, hi. Uh, thank you so much for letting me um, talk and maybe vent a little bit. Uh, I, I'm just, I wrote a, a some suggestions that our neighborhood uh, had on um, on uh, uh, parking and on traffic congestion. And one of the safety issues that I worry about is road rage because there's a lot of times when streets are blocked and people are angry. And we've had a lot of, we've had a huge increase in density with all the houses being popped up and uh, four units being made out of one household. So uh, we're getting a little desperate here, especially since you're um, going to be ticketing everybody. Um, I, I think I'm not quite sure where our suggestions went. Um, a lot of it has to do with having, you know, being like other major cities and having one way streets that go for a little longer than just a block and going in the same direction. Um, but if, if there's some way that you could try to accelerate some of these uh, issues that I don't think would take a lot of time, make it like a one way street, it's changing the signs. Maybe you do have to do a study, but um, it's not a huge investment. Um, but we'd really appreciate if you could look into uh, the suggestions that have been made because um, I, I'm just really worried that the, there, there have been times when there have been very angry people on my block and um, I would hate to see something bad happen. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, um, Alan yeah. Roth. Mm. Yeah. Commissioner Clem. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to Helen. Um, yes, Helen. Um, and I did want to um, give a shout out to Cynthia, who is incredibly responsive to the um, number of emails <laughs> and text messages that I send out. 
Um, and um, I got a response from Cynthia, Helen, for your suggestions, and I will be forwarding you that email. Great, great. Um, Alan Roth. Hi, good evening. Um, Director Lott, uh, first, thank you for your presentation. And, and most of all, thank you for your availability tonight to listen to, uh, listen to everybody's uh, comments and questions and, and complaints. Um, I, I wanna talk about this issue of, um, I, I don't know whether I call it transparency or not, but uh, most of what you've heard is from the perspective of commissioners. Um, I, I want to speak about it from the perspective of um, uh, your average citizen, um, specifically in reference to the 311 system, um, because I, I think your department in particular has a 311 problem. Um, when, when we enter a DDOT issue or a DDOT problem in the 311 system, um, it's been my experience that I, I frequently get a message back saying that the issue or the item has been dealt with and closed. Mm. In fact, nothing has been done. Um, or the only thing that's been done um, is that a contractor was called, um, but the contractor hasn't actually done anything. Um, and then when you try to get back in touch with the 311 call center uh, or you're transferred somewhere, whether it's DDOT or someplace else, uh, I'm not sure exactly where it's sent. Um, uh, you know, if, you, if, if they can even find the record for that uh, complaint number, um, the only information that they have is that th the item was dealt with and the item was closed. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll put this in context and say, I'm a former commissioner and I'm very persistent. Um, so I have managed in several cases to be able to find an individual within DDOT who is actually responsible for dealing with the issue I'm trying to get dealt with. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'll give great commendation to, for instance, recently, uh, a gentleman named Harvey Alexander, who dealt with getting a street light repaired on Florida Avenue at a very dangerous intersection um, that had been out for at least a couple of weeks, um, just completely dead. Um, and finally, when I reached Mr. Alexander, it got dealt with. Um, and um, uh, I, I, I could give you other examples, but um, not everybody is as persistent as I am uh, or will take the time to figure out which individual to call or how to even find that individual. Uh, instead, they just think DDOT is either incompetent or not responsive. So what you're hearing from commissioners from their perspective um, you know, I would say from the perspective of the public who may not even be, be speaking to their commissioners or going through their commissioners, just, you know, trying to use the 311 system, which we've been taught for the last decade is what we're supposed to do, uh, is not working. And it's specifically not working at DDOT. So I would really encourage you to please try to fix that. And I, I'm looking at the chat and seeing another gentleman who's who's saying exactly the same thing and saying it's a long-standing problem there. Um, please, please try to fix that. Wow. Thank you, uh, Alan. Um, Director Lott, do you want to respond to that before moving on to the next question? Um, sure. Uh, what I can say, you know, the three in one system, is, just for people to know, is not a system that is man maintained or operated by DDOT. That's a separate agency that handles that. Um, that's the Office of Unified Communications. So I definitely will share some of this feedback um, with the Office of Unified Communications um, as it particularly pertains to service requests um, that are coming into the three in one system for DDOT. Um, in many instances, um, some of those service requests may have been closed out um, for some very specific reasons. Um, a request that may have been made um, in which, you know, you may have thought that that is a DDOT responsibility, or it could be any other agency for that matter. Um, it's, it would have been closed out because it may not have actually been our agency or in another agency that was responsible for that. So they closed it out because it was assigned to a particular agency 
and that agency wasn't responsible for it. Um, so again, I think the system as a whole does have some, some areas where it needs to be improved so that things like that aren't just kind of closed out and it kind of either falls back on the resident to submit another request. Um, and so that's some feedback that I definitely will share with the Office of Unified Communications. But overall, I do hear um, 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 your concern uh, recognize that um, as a concern that's something that we will address from how we can address it from from the DDOT perspective. But I do want to make sure that it's clear that um, your um, the people on this call um, recognize and understand that uh, 301 is not maintained or handled by, D, by DDOT. Thank you, uh, Director Lott. And uh, uh, Chris? Hello? Yeah, you're, you're on. Chris, go right ahead. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Yep, you sure are. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, so Mr. Light has brought uh, an update about the overall budget. So um, one of the things, it's good to hear about the transportation issues and well, that is, uh, in addition to that though, it's very important to people like myself is uh, affordable housing. I heard uh, the mayor's doing an unprecedented or unparalleled amount of investment. The 400 million, isn't that over two years? And then uh, the follow-up question then is, um, how does the mayor define affordable housing? Like for a studio, how much is that per month? Or for a two bedroom, how much is that per month? Thank you. Chris, I wanna ask our chief administrative officer, um, Seisha Carlisle, to ask if she can step in and help out with that question. Sasha, are you on still? I am on still. Can you guys hear me okay? We sure can. And Chris, would you mind repeating that question? Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the question, um, uh, it's kind of a two-parter. And there was other questions I had, I mean, about public housing and an investment in actual public housing, and how much that would it is and is any of that in Adams Morgan. But the 400 million, that's over two years, right? And, and it's for affordable housing. So what is the mayor, how does the mayor define or how does your office define affordable housing? Like how much is a, a studio per month? How much is a two bedroom per month? Um, so really good question. So the 400 million, as I understand it, is the mayor's investment, uh, a commitment, I should say, to investing additional resources in the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, and there are different categories of affordable housing within the trust fund. Um, I'm certainly not the expert uh, here at DDOT. I uh, formerly was her deputy budget director, so bringing a little bit of knowledge from that prior role. Um, and I think we can probably flag the particulars of that, um, and I can probably pull up a little more detail on it, but the, the Housing Production Trust Fund investments um, allow entities building affordable housing to leverage those those funds to bring the projects to market, which would otherwise uh, be unaffordable, right, for a lot of builders. So that, as, as I understand it, her signature investment, the $400 million, that is in, in that fund, which supports uh, different tiers of affordable housing. Okay, that, that doesn't really, I mean, so the, okay. Uh, can we can we zoom in on Adams Morgan? Is there particularly any money for public housing or supporting of limited equity co-ops or community land trusts in one and in Adams Morgan? You know, I don't know. Unfortunately, the specific particulars as they relate to Adams Morgan. I know our partners at the Deputy Mayor's Office of Planning and Economic Development uh, would likely know and they have you know I'm sure they have a lot of detail on the potential project pipeline and projects underway okay I'm gonna have to get my answer somewhere else then thanks thank you Chris um so uh 
Um, unless I, I don't see any other hands up um, and Director Lott. Um, hey, was... Amir, do you mind if I oh, ask yeah, a question? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Director Lott. Um, my question has to do with a, a specific project in the capital improvement plan. Uh, over the in the proposed budget, you take the Benning Road reconstruction and streetcar project from a separate extension project and put it back into the full streetcar line item. Um, and so my question is, will the Benning project be able to access the full allotment balance, the 65 million and change that's in the, the budget, uh, the, the budget uh, authority there? And then will you be able to break ground next calendar year on this project? Well, Gordon, and I'll um, answer the part of the question that I can. I may um, ask Sasha to answer the other part. Um, we're not planning to break ground on the Benny Road extension until I believe it's 2023 or 2025. Um, we're still in the design phases now of that project. Um, um, that extension, as you know, requires a, a lot of design, um, a lot of working with our federal partners and NEPA. And so we're in that process now. Um, we do have money that has been budgeted so that the project is fully funded. And so that's something that based on, um, again, the mayor's leadership, also I know the council, council member Gray really had a, a significant role in making sure that, you know, that was funded. And so um, we're excited that it is funded because it does create opportunities for us to be able to connect um, uh, one thriving part of the community to another thriving part and um, ultimately get people connected to jobs and jobs to people. So um, if it's not funded for next, excuse me, it's not uh, slated to start for next year. I believe it's either 23 or 25. Now I'll double check that. We can circle back with you on that. Um, and then what was the second part of your question, um, Gordon? Oh, well, I think you answered both of them, but, but I did want to follow up the, um, the K Street Transit Way, which might have been the westward expansion of the streetcar many years ago or whatever. Um, the budget makes it look like that project is moving faster. It's gone from three years construction to two, at least if you look at the, the budget authority uh, division. Are, are you guys going to construct that quicker than, than, the, than the eastward expansion of the streetcar? So the K Street expansion or K Street Transit Way is, is a bus priority project um, we are building that in such a way that if we did decide, the mayor, mayor does decide at some point in the future um, to expand the streetcar going out west, then it would be able to accommodate that. Um, we are expected and planning to go to construction on that project next year. We're really excited about that. Um, I haven't seen the particulars of what you're referencing, but um, right now we're expected for that project to be completed um, in about from construction from next year, about 2024. Um, and so, you know, provided that, you know, weather conditions and we don't run into any other problems, then yeah, 2024 is when I think we're projected to, um, to complete that. I'm really excited about that, that particular project as well because of um, the fact that it's really going to improve our bus performance. Um, and again, going back to one of the questions that one of the other residents raised a little bit earlier about um, the number of cars and people on the roadways in, in singular vehicular um, uh, occupancy cars, um, this will allow folks to have another option, another alternative to be able to get them from point A to point B in a much more timely, much more efficient uh, manner, and also much more affordable. Thank you. Okay. Um, doesn't sound like we have any other uh, questions. Director Lott, thank you for uh, hanging in there for the long haul. This was <laughs> it's probably more than you bargained for. Um, but I appreciate you joining the meeting and uh, we'll certainly be in touch and follow up on some of these items um, after the meeting. Absolutely. And Commissioner, I just want to recognize again, I'm not the only one on this call. I have a full team of, of DDOT folks. Again, uh, Cynthia, as you all know, I'm David Jones and Sasha, who you just heard from. Um, and actually looks like I see Joe Kerwin's on the call as well. So we have a whole host of DDOT team members on this call that have stuck it out, um, but we're happy to be available uh, to answer qu questions after this. Um, as I mentioned to Commissioner Faulkner, happy to come out at any point in time to meet uh, out in the single member districts um, to see some of the specific challenges and issues that you may want to bring to our attention. So thank you all very much for the time and looking forward to the next time we can get together. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, moving to the uh, next agenda item. Um, so uh, Esther Siegel uh, from Licking Creek uh, Bend Farm uh, 
was going to provide a, a brief uh, update on the market opening, the Adams Morgan Farmers Market opening. Um, and, uh, but, you know, she had to hop off. So she had sent me a note saying that she had to hop off. And uh, however, um, she just wanted to get the word out that uh, the Adams Morgan Farmers Market is opening this Saturday, which I covered in the announcement. So um, if anyone has uh, a question for Esther, uh, feel free to email her at e-siegel, uh, E-S-I-E-G-E-L-2 at igc.org. So um, moving on to the next agenda item, uh, Jubilee Housing. Um, they have a few um, uh, development projects going on and programs in Adams Morgan. Uh, is there somebody from Jubilee on the line that can discuss uh, some of the current uh, development projects in Adams Morgan? If so, just raise your hand. I'm bringing them over. Okay. Hi, Amir. How are you? Hey. Has a long, long conversation with probably one of the most important people that touch everybody's lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, thanks for sticking it out, Marty. Um, everything okay? Oh, uh, um, it's my advice to everybody who's has light skin is wear sunscreen. <laughs> when you don't and you get to be my age, the basal skin sales cancer starts kicking in. So no, just a little had to cut off a little piece yesterday. I'm fine. Well, I'm glad you're here with us uh, and that it's uh, not serious. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for inviting us. And I have uh, one of my colleagues, um, Rebecca Eli is on and she's I think she's gonna, uh, we have a short PowerPoint, just it's easier to talk and tell you about what's happened with our projects. Um, but just for the rest of you, I'm Marty Mallet, I'm Vice President for External Affairs for Jubilee Housing and um, pronouns he, his and him. And um, just, just, you know, I, uh, Fiona asked us to do a little, just an update on a couple of projects. And uh, if, if someone can bring that up, we have two, four big projects kicking around right now. Um, the first one is, here goes Rebecca, uh, is our UCAL project. Let me see if we can get, it's probably easier just to see this. Sorry, one second, Marty, I'm coming. It just, it went away, hang on, okay. And so for those who don't know, it's this um, Jubilee housing has been in the neighborhood for probably over 40 years. We have about 300 units um, that we've already developed and we have some in projects in process. So this first one, uh, this is called our UCAL project. This is 1724 Calorama, which is in your ANC and then 1460, it's a combined project. Um, this is, we applied for DHED funding about two and a half years ago and we finally got the approval in March of this year. So this, this is uh, on the left is the, is the Calorama. This is right next to the Sitar building or to the Sitar Center, which is the ground floor. Um, it'll be nine, one bedrooms, two, seven twos and um, nine, three bedrooms. You know, one of the issues that Jubilee is working on is to provide deeply affordable housing for families. And that's a huge need in our, in our um, city. So we're gonna do that. Our headquarters, we're going to put our headquarters on the top. You'll see it peeping out at the top of the, um, the penthouse there. We're going to put our offices up there. And then um, the Sitar Arts Center, which is just to the left of us, that they're going to take up the whole ground floor. We're going to have a little space for public, probably for some community space, but mostly it's going to be their um, kind of young adult training program. So they're going to be on that ground floor. Um, we, in, in terms of timing, um, we are um, scheduled to probably close on all our construction and permanent financing in at the end of the year or early in 2022, and then begin construction with about a 12 month to 14 month construction period. So we're probably in 2023, you know, early 2024, when it would open up um, for, for um, uh, uh, use. We will not we will not do any construction before that the way, because we don't have the money to do that. We do that. We get our renovation and demolition 
money at the time of closing. So that's that one. Next one, Rebecca. Did you already do Euclid Street? I'm sorry. Well, I, yeah, that's there's Euclid there, but you don't really need to. Know, you, you can see it, um, but that's not in your ANC. That's that's over in the other ANC. You guys like it, but it's not really that that pertinent. It'll be a, a really beautiful building. Marty's experience at ANC meetings. He knows what's going on. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, and then, so the Ontario site is uh, right in front of Mary Center. This is the, there were four buildings that we bought about a year and a half ago. And, um, and then the KEB church. So those are the two sites. Um, this, we're, this, the, this will be 52 units. 27 will be set aside for men and women coming home from incarceration. 31 will be at 30% AMI, 21 at 60% and below. Half of the units will have two and three bedrooms. We'll have some of our property management staff on site. And then we're gonna have a solar array on the rooftop. And then most interesting, we're doing aquaponics in this project. We are working with a, a um, kind of a specialized entity called Fresh Farms that sets these things up in different urban areas. And so there's gonna be a, a ground floor um, aquaponics and then, a, and then a rooftop aquaponics on this. Um, so this will be, um, I think, go to the next slide there, Rebecca. Um, so this is, a uh, um, we're going to be producing about 13,000 plants a month. Uh, aquaponics means we have a big tank of water on, on the roof and on the ground floor, and that water feeds the, 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 the plants. We will grow that for our residents, but we will also grow it for, we're going to try to sell some of these to the, you know, to our neighboring farms. Like we had a, we had a call with one of our local restaurants recently. Our, the hope is that we're going to sell some of this to our um, and and to support this this endeavor. This is a workforce project, so some of the re returning citizens will get some experience in both running um, running this farm and uh, marketing our, our, the food that we get uh, produced. Um, let me see. Go back to this other one. Yeah, that go that one, Rebecca. And then the other one is King Emmanuel Baptist Church. That's on the corner. We will. We are not going to demo that. So the the other site, it will be demolished completely, and we'll go back up and put the 52 units. The King Emmanuel, we're going to add on some sections, but we're not going to demo that one. It's 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 actually not historic, but we're not we're going to maintain it. Uh, there'll be six uh, single room units, two six bedroom units. There'll be 18 residents. This is for immediate housing for returning citizens. We'll have a commercial kitchen there, um, and they're going to be a resource center. So this is really for folks just coming home from incarceration and we're gonna be having a lot of support services to get help them move into our transitional housing, which we have been owned and managed for the past 10 years up on 18th Street and Ontario Street on the other side of Columbia Road. Um, in terms of timing, oh yeah, so we go to, um, just in terms of timing. So we, are, we, we just pulled a raise permit that some of you may have seen that but we, we are not gonna be doing any, any dem demolition or renovation on this probably for two years because we need to get through the UCAL project that we just described, and then we will be moving into the next one after that. We don't have the, we don't have the financing. You heard the director talk about a big chunk of um, trust fund money being put in the, in the, in the hopper for next year. We're, you know, we will, along with other nonprofit developers, will apply for that money and hopefully get the money we need to redevelop this project. Both of these projects are, have total development costs about, of about 55 million each, and both of them need 12 to $17 million of trust fund to make them work for, you know, to keep them as affordable for the folks we wanna serve. So we will not, you will not see any renovation on either of these buildings. Um, the next, next year we'll start on, on the Calorama building, and the other one is probably another 18 months away. Um, go that one, yeah, go that side, Rebecca, yep. This is just, you know, we're going to have solar panels on this project and we're going to be doing a lot of, um, we're going to be selling food locally. Um, we're going to reduce um, water use. And you can see these, these are all, it's a, this is one of our, one of the, our, our new um, environmental efforts to try to respond to climate change. And then the last one, Rebecca, uh, and it's also workforce. So it's some of the, I think in one of our community sessions with you all, uh, some people asked about why don't you do some workforce and so we are going to do that so there will be some people that will work at the aquaponics farm and then we're going to have some kitchen training opportunities because uh, there will be a commercial kitchen in the 
um, in the in the church operation. So that's that's a summary. Rebecca, what have I missed that would be helpful? And then we can just see if there's any other questions. No, I think that, that was great, Marty. There was a couple questions in the chat um, that so um, about what aquaponics is, and I think and how is it different from hydroponics. I think Chris Babulia answered that in the chat, but um, it will include um, fish. So the fish will uh, support the plants, and the plants will support the um, fish, and they are sort of symbiotic that way. Um, and we're really excited about the environmental impacts that the building will have, as well as. But, but we're not the, sell, we're not selling the fish. The fish, you know, it's just the excrement from the fish supports the plants. So we're not going to, yeah. you know, maybe if, we'll, if you come by, we'll have a fish fly just right there. But we're not going to sell it commercially. The plants we will sell commercially, and we, and we're going to try to figure out. You know, we there's lots of restaurants in the neighborhood and the city that want to do double bottom line. They want good product, and they want to do it. Um, they want to keep it local, and so we're going to be able to do that. Uh, what else? Other questions from, from either commissioners or anybody? Um, we're, we're excited that this is going to happen. We're very excited that we got the nod on UCAL, and we're excited that this, this project is going to be moving towards construction pretty soon. There's, we, you know, we have, I think you all know, we get calls every day for people who need affordable housing, and we just don't have enough to do it. So this, these, this, these two projects are going to add um, you know, almost 125 units for housing for people who need it. So it's a good thing for our neighborhood and our city. Yeah, it sure is. Um, I do have a, a, a few questions. I'll start with uh, commissioners, Commissioner Bowles. Yeah, um, I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you so much for adding this housing to uh, Reed Cook as well as Adams Morgan. Uh, but particularly, this is like, some of the only affordable housing that there is in Adams Morgan. So like, thank you so much for continuing and moving forward. Additionally, the returning citizens aspect is very, very crucial to how we move forward with um, just a good society. So thank you for the work that you do there. Um, I, both of the, uh, not the Colorama, but the uh, Ontario and then the church Colorama site are in my single member district. And I just want to tell folks like you've been very, uh, very good at reaching out to neighbors, condo boards, in terms of making sure the properties are staying well kept. And um, I appreciate you continuing to be a good neighbor. So thanks what you're doing. Uh, thanks and uh, keep up doing the good work. Yeah, and just on, on Japer, I would just say if, if there are questions about up, upkeep, we have gotten questions recently and we, and we fix up and we can and sometimes people dump stuff on our property. Let us know, let me know. Um, we'll, we'll go and clean it up right away. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Helen Walsh. Thanks. Thanks, Marty. That's a really helpful um, presentation. And um, I guess this is, I, I don't know that you've done many new buildings. So this is kind of, I don't know, maybe Euclid is a new building. Um, and I'm, I, I really do worry a little bit about uh, supervision of the, of the raising and the construction process. Um, you, you reacted really quickly when I, when I let you know about how unsafe the situation was when they did the work uh, on the water, waterworks company. Um, but it just makes me wonder whether you guys are keeping a close enough eye. We shouldn't rely on me or somebody in the neighborhood giving you a call. And, so I'd like to urge you guys to try to have sort of like when you're in the work process to have people there um, looking at how the progress is going and supervising the workers and making sure that when they leave at the end of the day, the, the site is safe so that no one can get hurt um, walking by. Um, the, other, the other question and kind of concern I have is that, um, you know, the folks at DC jail and probably in federal institutions have been tortured for about a year, um, held in solitary confinement. I don't know what other federal penitentiaries have been like, but certainly DC jail. And I was really surprised that you guys didn't know about it until, um, until, the, D until the Post reported this. And um, what worries me is um, these folks have been damaged very badly, I would think, because that's what solitary confinement does to anybody. 
Um, so I, I really hope that you are going to work with the city to get additional funds for psychiatric support and any kind of mental health support that these people need because uh, the city did this to them and they owe these people um, the health care that they need to recover from it. So those are my two concerns. One is supervising and the other thing is to making sure that the people that are brought in have the adequate, one are not actually so badly damaged that they're not gonna be able to function, um, but also to support the people uh, um, uh, that you have with more than the resources that you've done um, for the normal re returnee um, projects. Yeah, thanks, Helen, I, and I appreciate that and appreciate you letting us know about the, the cutoff a couple of weeks ago. Um, you're right that we, we have never done a, a demo in full, you know, kind of full construction, but we have also renovated all of our buildings, which have been equivalent to that. So that, that, that we, we do have a sensitivity to making sure that, you know, we, we do our projects carefully and safely in the neighborhood. So we will, um, you know, we're going to try to do that. We think we've done it in the past and we will continue to do it when we move into construction. Um, you know, and I, and I agree with you that, you know, for a lot of our residents who are coming in, that they have struggled and they've had damage from lots of stuff. I mean, most of our residents are probably coming in from federal penitentiaries, so they're not necessarily coming straight from the D.C. jail. So it's kind of a, a little bit different, but it's the same, you know, it's the same issue that people have big needs. And so we do have a lot of good support in terms of staff, and we will be looking for some more support um, as that, you know, as, as those folks come into our, into our care. But thank you for that comment. Thanks. Eric, go right ahead. Uh, yes, am I un unmuted? You sure are. Okay, great. Yeah, this is a question for uh, Marty uh, in regards to the returning citizens program. Jubilee, Jubilee is looking to um, expand upon and operate at the uh, King Emanuel Church. Uh, it's kind of two parts here. One, uh, the 18 residents you're referring to, it's my understanding that that is kind of a revolving door of sorts, that the capacity is 18 residents, but the program you offer is for a year. And then at which point then another 18, or there's a kind of a, maybe you could speak to the volume of in and out that's occurring there. And then the second is more of a comment regarding the placement of this facility within proximity to a number of elementary schools, uh, the Sitar Center, Mary Center. Um, what considerations is Jubilee uh, prepared to, to do to keep the children that, you know, or in their neighborhood, come to the neighborhood, will be walking past this facility um, pretty much every day during the school year. Thank you, those are good questions uh, and important questions. Um, in terms of the immediate housing at, at, Kate, at the King Emanuel Baptist, you know, we have capacity for 18 and the assumption is uh, this is shorter term housing. So it's, it's kind of the immediate and then folks would move into our transitional and then into the permanent, which is at the next door. Um, so my, our, you know, again, people kind of come in and go um, based on some of their needs and, and their ability to kind of progress. We anticipate probably, you know, that these residents would be there from, from four to six months. So at least a, a one, at least a one turnover per year. So, uh, and, and maybe a little bit more depending on if people get a little better and if we have space in our transitional housing. So at least, you know, probably 36 per year and, and maybe some more. Um, in terms of the, um, the specifics about um, how do we keep safe, you know, I, I think that keep the neighborhood safe from residents. I, again, I, I think that we have a fairly good track record for, you know, again, from our experience of running two transitional houses on 18th Street and on Ontario for the past 10 years. We've never had any neighborhood incidents. Um, many of the residents are they're not going to be that much different from the ones coming in for the immediate housing. Um, we will, we do have 24 seven supervision. There are expectations of people coming in. Uh, we do, you know, you know, we do a fairly stiff interview process. We are looking for people who want to get better. 
So all of those are kind of the, what we would consider mediating factors to try to make sure that, that the neighborhood is as safe as possible. Um, Rebecca, do you have any other kind of just follow up on that? Because I, I think this is, this is an important question. Yeah, and I, I, it is an important question. I do want to name that we have lots of um, youth and families that will be living in, in these buildings as well. So even some of the returning citizens will be families that have been reunited. Um, so we, it is um, important to us to also, you know, ensure the safety of the neighborhood. Um, and and we are committed to that. And whenever there, if there is an issue where someone isn't following the guidelines and the rules that are set for the buildings, they would be um, asked to leave the program and we would facilitate that um, departure. Um, and yeah. Do you have a copy of those rules? Sure. Do you have a copy yeah. of those? I can, we can get you summaries of those. Yep. I'm not sure who asked that, but. It was from Helen. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that, thanks. That's okay. Please uh, raise your hand if you have a, a question or a comment. All right, um, questions from commissioners. Members of the public, okay, Marty, um, thank you for joining us. Yep, and we'll see when construction begins. No, I'll see you before that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Marty. Sorry, there was one question in the chat about when we expect people to move into um, Calorama. It's 2023, 24. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't. We won't even begin construction. We don't have financing on the other projects until, you know, probably. We we just don't know. It's probably about a year, year and a half, and then, and then there's a year and a year and a half of construction. So we're two and a half years probably away from opening both of those facilities. But Calorama, the, the Sitar one is earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I say both, I meant the Ontario KEB. Um, yep. Okay. So, so 2023. It was good to meet you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Over Zoom. And uh, Marty, I hope, yep. uh, you know, I hope this resolves itself uh, pretty soon. <laughs> Until the next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good Air sunscreen yeah yeah exactly wise advice <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys see you later um okay so uh moving uh to our next speaker um from ddot uh joseph uh kerwin uh will deliver a overview of uh the new uh park dc permits uh, system that's currently being piloted, but will be open to all district residents in just a month. So uh, go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, hi everyone, thank you. And so I'm gonna share my screen or attempt to share my screen real quick and then I have a quick PowerPoint. I, um, I got it under five minutes earlier today, so I will try to do that again here just to uh, Make sure we're moving right along. So hi, hi everyone. Um, thanks for thanks for having us present. Um, my name is Joe Kerwin with the District Department of Transportation, uh, here to provide a brief overview of our new visitor parking um, permit system, Park DC permits. Uh, so what what is Park DC permits? Um, it's a new new centralized system where um, district residents and their visitors and uh, contractors and and home health aides will create and manage vis visitor um, parking permits via, via an online portal that is available on the Park DC permits website and, um, and also the uh, free mobile app. So residents um, can control who can visit them by uh, approving and denying and um, adding or removing visitor requests through their account. They, they can also choose to uh, blanket approve sort of like a frequent visitors, um, or they can individually approve each, each person each time they visit. And uh, visitors will uh, request the parking permissions using the unique um, resident code that the system generates and the resident has to provide it to them. And uh, once approved, the visitor um, prints the permit and displays it on the dashboard and park bars. So uh, previously, I'm sure you all are familiar, residents could get the annual 
um, visitor parking pass, as well as uh, the temporary 15-day parking permits from, from MPD. Uh, so Park DC permits combines those two permits into a single visitor parking permit with similar um, permission. So this, this new permit allows a single visitor to park um, one at a time for an unlimited um, period of time. Uh, and, and then along with that single unlimited permit, residents um, will have the ability to host um, additional, additional guests for um, up to a total of 90 days, which is a, a little over 2,000 hours. So that, that, bank of, that bank of time um, will be used when the resident has more than one guest. And, and if that runs out, um, residents can still host visitors one at a time under, under the unlimited permit. And, and like the current annual permit, uh, you will need to review, uh, renew this permit um, every year via the Park DC permit system. Um, and, and this system has also integrated the contractor and home health aid permits that were um, previously available through DMV. So how, how to access this system? We have a website. Um, the link is right here and I'll, I'll put this in the chat as well. So that's our, um, our, our web portal is available through there. And then also we have the mobile app, which is up right now on um, the Apple Store and Google Play. We also have a 24 seven call center, 202-671-2631. So this is a dedicated, um, dedicated call center for Park DC permits. It's open 24 uh, seven and, it, and it's not just a helpline. Um, users will be able to, to fully access this system via the call center. Um, if they don't want to use the web portal for some reason. And, and, and we also have um, kiosks uh, around the city where people can access their account um, via the kiosks and um, uh, have full access to the web portal and, and print um, permits as well. So we have those located at DDOT headquarters, which is um, still, I think, under final construction right now. And then the DDOT permit office and the MPD district stations. Uh, across all eight wards, and th those are the same as the Tox kiosks, if you all are familiar with that. Um, so yes, the, the, the permits do have to be printed and displayed on the, on the windshield. Um, the, the, they're available to print from any printer um, from the convenience of the home. Um, both the resident and the visitor can print once the permit is approved, so there's a little bit of, of flexibility there. Um, and yeah, uh, they can be printed at any printer, um, you know, DC Public Libraries, and also these um, DDOT kiosks that we uh, we have made available. So where are we? Um, it's being tested, pilot pilot tested in ANCs one D and six B right now. That was um, that began on May twelfth. So we're we're spending May and June um, doing outreach to to ANCs about the system and gathering. Uh, feedback and also gathering data and learning lessons from ANCs 6B and 1D and integrating those lessons into the full the full program launch um, in July um, for the for the district wide program launch and and then to give um, people a little bit of a transition time we have extended the 2020 annual visitor parking passes um, so so they will remain valid across the district until September 30th. This is our contact information, which I can I can post in the chat as well. The call center um, is a great resource, and uh, we're also asking people to email us at uh, d.parking.dc.gov. We have we have some additional um, information at parkdc.com, and then there's a lot of great resources on the registration site as well. And I'll put all those links um, in the chat. Yeah, so thank you, thank you so much for having us present. Um, I, I'll. Uh, Give the time back to you. I'm happy, happy to answer questions as well. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, question from uh, Commissioner Gold. Thank you, Joseph, for, for joining us tonight. Um, I guess uh, uh, my main question is what information is necessary to be uh, entered into the system in order for DDOT to then issue the visitor parking permit? Um, so yeah, to get the, the residential permit, um, you enter, you go in, you enter your address, put your name in, um, go in and sign up. Um, 
Yeah, I want to. I want to say you you have uh, some ID that you have to upload as well, but um, I I don't don't quote me on that, but I, I can uh, get you a full um, rundown of that process um, after the meeting. But do you do you require the, for example, the license plate number of the vehicle in which you're putting this pass? Yeah. So to sign up to add a vehicle to the account, it's a license plate um, and a and a make model as well. I think. So you know, one of the uh, many things concern me about this project. Uh, one is that uh, it puts a lot of burden on residents. Uh, right. This is. 2021, not all of us have printers at home. And yes, we can all go to a library or to MPD headquarters or perhaps make our way down to the DDOT headquarters. But uh, that is as an alternative to taking the parking pass that DDOT mails us once a month and handing it to our visitor. Um, for, for my um, constituents, the majority of whom do not have vehicles, uh, I know that there is a lot, uh, there, there are a lot of residents, myself included, who uh, rent cars for a weekend for errands. Uh, and so now this process is going to make me, uh, when I rent a car, I'm then going to have to, not until I have that car in my possession, be able to have, uh, be able to legally park because I won't know that make and model and license plate number before, until I or any of my constituents get this. Um, so those are immediate concerns. More broadly, Joseph, what problem is this new system trying to solve? What was wrong with the, you know, applying and mailing out uh, visitor parking passes for, for your department that you need to go through this process of significant burden on residents? Yeah, definitely. So, um... Some of the problems that we saw with the, the previous system, um, fraud and, and abuse and um, of annual visitor parking, and then sort of um, to the temporary permit, lack of um, good record keeping or um, easy accessibility for users. So um, I think what we've tried to do here is integrate them into a user-friendly um, user -friendly portal here realize that there's some work to do on the digitization side. Um, that's something we're pursuing as well. Not gonna be available right at the gate, but um, that's definitely our, our goal to move away, away from the printed permits and have it be an entirely digital system where someone could um, get the rental car, punch it in right on their app, issue, issue the permit and uh, be able to park very conveniently. Assuming that I have a printer in my car. Uh, and yeah, and this is in the, in the future if once that uh, once it moves into an entirely digital system. But um, no, in, in that case, no, you would have to um, go print, print out the permit or um, the person you're visiting or um, you, if you're the resident, could print the permit out. All right. Uh, thank you for, I mean, I, you know, I've raised the issues I have, but thank you for being here today and, and walking us through it. Thank you. Uh, other questions from commissioners uh, or members of the public? Seems like there's some, uh, um, oh, there we go, okay. Jay Sardarsky. So I had put this in the chat as well, but I'll just bring it to the to voice. Um, has there been any testing and outreach with older residents or just generally those who aren't online and who may not have, uh, you know, first of all, may not be in meetings like this, but then just may not have the kind of computer device access, you know, beyond just the printer access that Zach mentioned, but, you know, may not have computers at all. Uh, and then secondly, uh, with communities and with residents who don't read or speak English fluently. We've seen a number of these attempts by DC government in the last year to bring out various apps and programs and they are not available in languages other than English, um, which is something that is required by DC law dating back over a decade and a half now. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you for those questions. Um, the the system in its entirety and the outreach content and the mobile app will be fully translated into in the DC Language Act, Act languages. Um, so, so we have some um, outreach sort of in the works for older residents for doing, um, but, but also standing up our, um, our uh, DDOT call center and then the, um, the dedicated Park DC Permits Call Center to really make sure that that call center provides a fully functional, um, besides printing, of course, fully functional access to the system. So if a resident is not comfortable with um, using a website or maybe they, they don't have um, access to the technology required, they can go and access the system via that call center and then um, get the permit printed either by the visitor or, or um, on some other printer as well. So, but we do have some um, targeted at, uh, outreach to older residents coming online this month prior to the uh, July launch for this the district wide. Thank you, Joseph, uh, for that. Uh, other questions from uh, members of the public or commissioners? Okay, uh, seeing none. Um, thanks for popping into the meeting and for hanging out for about two hours while we got through the uh, other agenda items. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And, and any questions at all, ddot.parking at dc.gov. Please, we're, we're, we're very, um, very open to feedback and comments. Thanks. If you could just put the website for the registration in the chat, that would be helpful. Thank you. I will do that as well. Thanks. Great. Okay. Um, now moving to uh, public announcements. So, um, <laughs> Usually this is a, a bit earlier in the meeting, um, but I'll just take it from the top. So Kristen, I'm sorry, Allie, you have your hand up, go right ahead. Hi all, how is everybody doing? Thanks for having me. Um, I will make it really fast since we're already past nine and you all heard quite a bit about the budget tonight, but um, of course, you know, the mayor presented her budget to you all and to the council today and um, we are now in budget oversight hearing. So as always, if anybody has any questions, um, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself given, given the late hour, I'm a little tired. My name is Ali Bobak. I'm the deputy director for constituent services for ward one council member in a doe. So given that we are in budget oversight hearings, if anybody has any questions about um, schedules, et cetera, for the DC council budget oversight hearings, you can, either email me at abobak at dccouncil.us or you can feel free to give me a call at 202-531-5186 and I will be sure to put that in the chat. That's really what our office is, is mainly focusing on. Um, one thing I did wanna highlight is that today, Councilmember Nadeau co-chaired a hearing around, um, or yesterday, Councilmember Nadeau co-chaired a hearing around the State DC program. I know that's something that was mentioned by a few commissioners. Um, and that's something we really want to get out there. There's $350 million in rental assistance that can back pay your rental assistance and utility assistance. And we're happy to work with constituents to try to get their applications in for that. Um, and besides that, I think I will leave it there given the time. But again, I will put my information in the chat. And of course here, if anybody has any questions, if any commissioners or public has any questions for me. Thank you, Allie. Um, Kristen. Hi, everyone. Um, Kristen Barden here, the, um, the executive director of the Adams Morgan Partnership. Um, thanks, um, as always, for a really informative meeting. Um, I, uh, I think that this ANC does a really great job in trying to get a lot of information out to people. So um, we're really appreciative. Um, a couple of announcements from us. Um, our office is moving. Um, I think you all have heard about the Festival Center's uh, renovations that are starting later this month. Um, we're moving tomorrow, um, actually, to 2424 18th Street. We'll be on the second floor up above the uh, former Wawa space. So um, you can find us there um, starting tomorrow afternoon. 
Um, and also the Festival Center um, in preparation for their renovations are gonna be doing a community giveaway from June 15th to the 18th, um, giving away desks and bookshelves and cabinets, chairs, books, um, a refrigerator, um, pictures that haven't found a home yet and other things. So it'll be from 10 to two, um, June 15th to 18th. Um, we are going to be doing um, some cool um, springtime events one that I think many of you will remember fondly, um, and one new one. So um, the drag queen story time that the hotel used to do in the community center, um, we're taking that outside, um, and we're going to be doing it in Unity Park on the um, on one Sunday a month. Um, it's going to start on Sunday, June 13th. I think it's the second Sunday of every month, um, June, July, August, and September. We're partnering with the Lion Hotel um, to do this, but um, uh, and also with um, DC Public Library and um, the DCPL will have, <clears throat> excuse me, their um, uh, bike, um, their their book bike, um, so that kids can actually check out books and take them home um, as part of the drag queen story time. Um, so you do need to register um, ahead of time. We want to make sure that that there's enough room and um, that um, and that there's people that actually can come each time since we're um, paying the drag queens to be there. Um, so uh, it starts again uh, Sunday, June 13th at 11 a.m. And then um, I'm sure lots of you were waiting and hoping an anxiously that we would be doing our Adams Morgan movie nights again, and we are. Um, we're going to start Monday, July 12th. Um, it'll be a five week series again on Monday nights. Um, and we will include at least one rain date at the end of um, August. Um, and um, the theme this year is going to be um, DC films. So uh, we're going to kick it off with um, a, a, a local movie that was made about the punk rock scene. Um, on July 12th, and then all the rest of the movies are movies that were actually filmed in DC. So they might not be about DC, but they were filmed here. So that's the theme for this year. Um, and um, I think that's it. I think that's all of our, our announcements for now, but um, stay tuned for more details about the movie nights. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, Cheryl Hardy. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me. Do I need to um, turn my camera on or we're good? It's uh, totally as you wish. So, you know, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, you're, of course, free to turn your camera on as well. Hold on one second. I she has to be a panelist to use her uh, camera, so I just moved her. Okay. Hey Cheryl. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, Cheryl C. C. Hardy. And this year I am the Adams Morgan Day Festival Coordinator. I've been part of the festival in some capacity since 2005 and hope to continue moving forward. So I wanna kind of give you an update on what's going on with the festival. Creativity comes alive as the 42nd Adams Morgan Day Festival will be held on Sunday, September 12th from 11.30 a.m. to seven o'clock p.m. Our festival organizers, the Adams Morgan Day Community Alliance, we're planning a hybrid approach with outdoor and uh, virtual components. The highlights of the festival this year will include the celebration of international cultures through its unique collection of local acts, specialty vendors, our ever so popular songbird music stage, the return of our interactive dance plaza hosted by yours truly, our art, culture, and history segment, providing an insight on the community, past, present, and future, as well as the Volo Kids Zone. We are in the process of securing public spaces. The streets will remain open this year. 
As we are gearing up for another year of fun, we need volunteers who are passionate about the neighborhood and passionate about the Adams Morgan Day Festival. If you are interested in volunteering, please send an email to adamsmorganalliance at gmail.com. Once again, that's adamsmorganalliance at gmail.com. And also check out our Get Involved section of our website at www admoday.com. Again, the website is www.admoday.com. Thank you guys very much for having me. Thank you, Cheryl, uh, for hopping in and making that announcement. If you don't mind, would you uh, just please place those uh, uh, URLs and that information into the chat? Yes, I will. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, shame we couldn't have it last year, but uh, or shame we, it couldn't be, you know, street closure and that kind of uh, in-person fun. Um, but thanks for coming tonight. Okay, um, so uh, if there are no other public announcements or hands raised, uh, let's go on to our consent agenda. Hey, Amir, there's uh, one more person. Okay. Ah, Moises. Great. Go right ahead. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Um, I won't try to take too much of your time. I know we had a, a action-packed uh, agenda tonight. Let me see if I can turn my camera on. There we go. Um, well, first, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm definitely excited for a change of routine um, and the opportunity to join the 1C community tonight. Uh, for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, uh, my name is Moises de Rosario, and I have the pleasure of serving as the other half of the Ward 1 Mokers, uh, primarily serving the ANC 1A and ANC 1D community. Um, unfortunately, Anthony was unable to attend tonight, but I do have a few brief updates to provide to the community. Um, firstly, just want to thank everyone who participated in our last COVID-19 Community Day of Action, uh, which was on May 22nd. Uh, we had over 100 volunteers join us at our staging location here in Ward 1, and we were able to have conversations with over 1,700 Ward 1 residents about making a plan to get vaccinated. So thank you very much to everyone that was able to join us. Just as a reminder, and though it hasn't been officially announced just yet, we do have another day of action scheduled for Saturday, June 19th. Um, so if you're interested in joining us, I'll be placing the uh, sign up link in the chat box below. Uh, the site should be updated for residents to sign up for a volunteer shift later this week. Um, and also, I just always like to take the opportunity to remind neighbors that Every DC resident over the age of 12 is eligible for a free COVID-19 vaccine. Um, as I'm sure you already know, uh, the district does operate high capacity vaccination sites throughout the city. Uh, so these are the walk up, no appointment needed sites. So if you are interested in receiving your vaccination shot, I'll also be leaving a link to the Vaccinate DC site, which lists all the available vaccination centers, uh, their hours of operations and what vaccine will be administered that day. Um, and lastly, as far as the updates, uh, Mayor Bowser does invite the community uh, to celebrate the one year anniversary of the unveiling of the Black Lives Matter Plaza on June 5th uh, at 11.30 a.m. So the event is gonna take place at Black Lives Matter Plaza uh, and we'll be featuring a workout that will be led by Jim Jones uh, the first 100 participants will receive a free Black Lives Matter Plaza workout mat. Uh, there'll be performances by the uh, Backyard Band, refreshments by Turning Natural, and there's also going to be a walk-up vaccination clinic on site uh, where the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be administered. Um, so if you have time this weekend, please join us. I'll also leave that link in the chat box so that any community members can also um, RSVP for the event. I mean, I think that's all. With that, um, Mokers are always at your service. Really excited to be here tonight. Uh, my contact information will also be listed. Uh, please feel free to reach out whenever there's an opportunity for Mokers to be of service. 
Um, I know commissioners and neighbors may have follow-up budget questions about specific investments here in the ward. Um, so feel, please feel free to reach out to either Anthony or myself so that we can get you that additional um, information. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your time tonight, ANC 1C, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Moises, uh, and thanks for uh, all your work in the community and for joining us on those walks more recently. Um, do we have questions from uh, commissioners or members of the public for Moises? Okay. Um, seeing none, uh, let's uh, go over to our consent agenda. We have one item on our consent agenda, it's to approve the minutes from our May 2021 meeting. All right, Mr. Chair, just to cut in, do, uh, do we want a presentation from M MPD tonight or should we host them at the ABC meeting next week? Um, we don't have a presentation from MPD on our agenda. Uh, the commander, I think we had addressed this earlier in the meeting, the commander had, uh, Commander Kim uh, was to introduce himself. However, something came up uh, and I had spoken to him on the phone and he'll be joining us at our next meeting. Great, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just saw that MPD, the representatives that are on the line were offering themselves, uh, but we'll take that normal call during our ABC meeting. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so um, uh, the consent agenda, as I was saying, um, we just have the minutes from uh, May, 2021, that's last month to approve. Um, so if there aren't any questions, I'll just call to a vote. All those in favor of adopting uh, the consent agenda, uh, please say aye. 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 Any against, any abstentions? All right. And uh, <laughs> moving on to um, our regular agenda. Uh, we don't have any preliminary matters uh, because the couple of items we have just came out of committee um, and we don't have anything from the ABC and Public Safety Committee. So we'll move right on to the resolution that came uh, out of PZT uh, with um, a unanimous uh, of support. It's a resolution that is providing feedback on uh, the draft Move DC uh, 2021 update. Um, for those of you uh, that don't know, Move DC is the long-term um, transportation plan for DC. Um, and uh, the point of Move DC and going through all this public uh, feedback and this public process uh, is to make sure that that reflects the needs and desires and priorities of the residents of DC. And so uh, this is a a pretty good resolution that we spent a significant amount of time going over uh, during PZT meeting uh, line by line. And um, I think uh, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Commissioner Gold, who uh, diligently took that time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, noting the current time is 9.24. And uh, as you noted, we went through this very precisely um, during the PZT committee meeting. Um, and of course, uh, the community and the uh, uh, commissioners who were not part of that committee uh, had the time to go through with it. I think I would just um, remark on a number of changes that have been made uh, since that time. Um, and uh, so commissioners, you all have edit rights and therefore can see the proposed uh, changes in the document. Let me. Uh, for those of you who don't have it open immediately, because you're not crazy like me, uh, this is the document. Um, and again, uh, the, so the purpose of this resolution is that um, DDOT and the Move DC planning team have actually done really fantastic. And we, we, we spoke earlier about, uh, we, we criticized rightly uh, DDOT for its lack of transparency. Um, and I would say that this, the team writing this, um, this uh, long-term strategy have actually been both incredibly transparent and, uh, and incredibly uh, open and active in their outreach to uh, individual communities, to um, uh, all eight wards, 
and especially to um, advisory neighborhood commissioners. Um, and so they uh, presented in three different fora, uh, the, the, the almost final move DC draft, um, you know, thinking about the strategies that DDOT needs to carry out in order to uh, fulfill its long its, its long term goals for what this city's transportation networks should be, um, and they asked for us for our us commissioners, um, and they didn't ask for any particular method. So I'm sure that individual commissioners are writing individual letters. I have seen uh, letters written by uh, and signed by uh, full commissions. Um, the approach that that we took was to write a whole resolution that uh, I think that when we transfer this, we will transfer it with a letter that lists out all of our comments. Um, Move DC itself uh, is a, um, I just wanna get this right. There are 18 different policy areas with 57 strategies under those policies. Um, and so I focused when writing this resolution, especially on the safety, on the, on the uh, road safety issues and on the curbside management issues um, and on the conflict between bicycle networks, transit networks and freight networks that I think we do and, and will continue to see in our neighborhood. Um, so I made a number of uh, adjustments or I proposed another, a number of changes since our discussion at the PZT meeting. Um, and those are, uh, are, are essentially fourfold. One is uh, the PZT committee asked for better language for the, for the final uh, resolved clause. And so you will see that I um, specify in that final resolved clause, or I propose uh, uh, specifying that um, DDOT should follow this strategy. And the, uh, the chair asked during the meeting, you know, why do we need to say this? It's their strategy. Of course, they're going to follow it. Um, and unfortunately, we have found over the course of the DDOT uh, at Move DC 2014 that they do not follow it. And they refer to it simply as a document and not as an overarching strategy. And so we ask DDOT to actually commit to implementing the strategy. Um, and the way that I look at that is that all projects that are currently at 30% design and below, uh, which means the projects that are really just in their initial design and still have a long way to go, should be implemented in alignment with Move DC 2021 strategic plan and to provide public justification anytime a project conflicts with those Move DC goals. Uh, the other question that we, the other questions that came up during the PZT me meeting were about specificity of metrics and data. Um, there were times in this that the strategies of Move DC mentioned specific metrics and times that they did not. So uh, Chair and Commissioner uh, Faulkner were very uh, keen to make sure that we understand, right, again, it's about transparency. What are the metrics that they're using to determine which roads uh, need to be uh, made more safe? You know, how parking demand is assessed, those sorts of things. So I changed language in a couple parts uh, that specified um, the types of metrics that we were looking for, and more importantly, asking DDOT to be public with its metrics. Um, I think the third area that I adapted, um, oh, sorry, the, the third area that I adapted from that PZT meeting was a question of whether or not there is a national level guidance for specifying transit network treatments. Uh, and in fact, there are. And so with uh, bike, DC, with bike uh, facility guidance, uh, both from the Federal Highways and from NACDO, those really talk about the busyness of the streets. And so if the street is really busy, uh, it needs some sort of, uh, either it needs protection or it needs uh, separation or the, these things based on, on the, the type of street. For uh, transit, it's less about how busy the street is and more about the location and use of the streets. So for example, a downtown area would have different treatments than um, you know, Connecticut Avenue north of Calvert Street, uh, you know, those sorts of things. And so there is guidance. And so I did change the language there to call for uh, the transit priority network 
to be uh, a specific roadway to, uh, to re recommend the treatments for specific roadway types in neighborhoods of particular density following NACTO guidance, similar to the guidance for bicycle priority network facilities. Um, and the last changes I'm recommending um, come not from the PZT, and so these are a little more in depth, and that's in conversations with other um, commissioners, especially um, in even in, in less, both in dense communities like Adams Morgan and in less dense communities like uh, Upper Northwest, they, you know, one of the remarks was that this is a transit priority network that speaks very little to pedestrianization of, tra of transit in the sense that, for example, if, you know, someone who lives in Adams Morgan and works in DuPont might walk to work or someone who works in Adams Morgan and lives in Adams Morgan might walk to work, but there isn't really a focus in this long-term strategy of safe walking, of making sure that sidewalks are uh, connected, um, that making sure that sidewalks are well treated. Um, whereas uh, DDOT in this plan focused more on intersections and crossings, to, so making sure that uh, sidewalk crossings were safe. And of course, it's important that sidewalk crossings are safe, but people also need to be able to walk down a single sidewalk. I know, for example, on Columbia Road, I've seen individuals in uh, using wheelchairs and they'll roll their wheelchairs in the bike lane on Columbia Road because the bike lane is at least relatively smooth compared to the sidewalk on Columbia Road. Um, so so um, I added a, a number of uh, clauses, both uh, whereas clauses and resolutions about um, pedestrianization. Um, and, that, and I think I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to um, take feedback from any of the commissioners and from members of the community, and then we can maybe um, accept or, or edit any of those changes that, that, I, that I've marked. Thank you, Commissioner Gold, for that. Um, and for uh, making, not only uh, going over uh, what happened at PZT and some of the changes since then, uh, but for uh, remarking in some of the detail um, of some of the changes that didn't come from PZT, uh, which I think are some good ones in there uh, as I'm reading through it, the sidewalk and the pedestrianization. So um, uh, I'd like to start with questions from our fellow commissioners, if there are any, um, and then uh, we'll move. Okay, there we go. Uh, Commissioner Faulkner, go right ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Commissioner Gold for um, all his work um, on on this. Um, and I uh, just wanted to know, I appreciate the additions about the pedestrian infrastructure and all of that, because um, I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, amid all the different things to mention, I think um, it's, it's good to, to add more about that. So just wanted to say thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, Chris, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep, we sure can. Right on. Okay, this is an important uh, conversation. A uh, couple of questions for Commissioner Gold. Um, one, um, did DDOT bring in uh, the pedestrian master plan at all, which I think might date back to 2016, but it exists. And you know, we pay all these consultants and these agencies pay all these consultants all this money to put together these beautiful looking plans, but seem to forget about them after they're printed. Um, that might be one thing to, to look at and bring in in terms of the pedestrianization. And the other question is, you know, we, we kind of um, saw this ANC uh, kind of get blindsided and, and we're talking about our community with like a last minute up uh, unlocking of up zoning along Columbia Road and U Street, um, uh, which you know I'm still kind of perplexed about how that went down. Uh, I think a backyard porch gets more analysis uh, under this commission than the up plumbing along Columbia Road, but that's going to mean significantly more density. When you were just talking about how you know in areas where density is a is a factor, like how does that play into this? And I wonder with the 200 million square feet of density up plumbing around the city, has that been brought into any of this analysis 
and particularly the last minute of Fleming and Adams Morgan. Commissioner Gold. Here, thank you uh, for that, Chris. Here is the um, page from Move DC. And I will say, again, this goes back to the responsiveness of the Move DC team. Um, as, I, as, as is noted in the resolution, um, you know, Move DC came out with a number of uh, surveys and they held a number of meeting in which they held uh, uh, other surveys and, and I took questions and said, you know, what is your priority? And um, time after time after time, uh, the, the number two, the, so the number one response was, be, was transit. The number two response was, um, was better pedestrian infrastructure. And that came, uh, that was a, the, the number two response in a project that did not focus on pedestrians. So uh, what I just shared in the, as a, is a link is, is a creation of a pedestrian, friend, pedestrian friendliness index, which is um, uh, and, and uh, a discussion of an updated sidewalk gap map. Uh, those are new developments in Move DC because of feedback from, uh, from October uh, of last year. So when, the, when DDOT first came to uh, communities, they said, we're looking at a, uh, a transit priority, a freight priority, and a bicycle priority. So I'm coming off the screen. Um, and uh, and you know, what are your priorities of these three? And over and over and over again, everyone said, pedestrian. So they actually had, were responsive. And in this draft that came out uh, in, um, uh, in this uh, past um, spring, they, they brought pedestrian uh, issues to the table in a way they had not before. So thanks for raising that issue. Um, other questions uh, from members of the public or commissioners? Okay, seeing none. Um, I will call to a vote on the resolution. It did come out of committee. Uh, with uh, uh, three zero support, call to a vote. All well, I think I think for sorry as a point of order, I think we should first vote on the changes, unless you don't think that's appropriate. Um, I consider them friendly, con because you put them in. <laughs> okay, then I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna accept them all. Let's see how I can do that so that it, uh, they're seeable. Let's see, accept. Okay, sorry. Continue. Uh, Chair. Sure. So, um, uh, all those in favor of the uh, resolution providing feedback on Move DC, say aye. 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 Uh, any against? Any abstentions? Eight zero. Great. Um, it's a fantastic resolution, and uh, really had a lot of time to uh, work through uh, the details. Um, with other members of the commission. So thank you and other commissioners in general. So thanks a lot, Zach, for bringing that to the table. Um, so the next uh, item on our agenda, uh, the next and the last one, <laughs> um, it's a resolution that also came out of uh, PZT, but um, came out of PSC as well. Um, so this one is a letter outlining the budget priorities uh, for fiscal year 2022. Uh, we had a lot of talk about budget earlier this in the meeting. Um, Director Lott's presentation, in addition to the DDOT portion, was initially focused on the mayor's budget. So this uh, resolution is, as I understand it, um, mostly a wish list. Um, and there is uh, a, um, a therefore at the end of the resolution. Um, so I would like uh, Commissioner Bowles, uh, if you'd like to introduce the resolution, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, certainly. Thank you so much, um, Chair Ronnie. So as uh, the chair mentioned, we uh, hopefully will be sending a letter um, 
outlining ANC 1C's budget priorities for the fiscal year 2022, um, the ANC has no uh, power to enact these and or legislate these. Um, this is simply uh, messaging and stating to our council members and to our mayor that these are the things that we think that they should fund. These are the critical needs for Adams Morgan as well as the greater community. Um, I uh, worked on this with quite a few other ANC commissioners. Um, there's a lot of things that we've already previously discussed, such as funding the Adams Morgan pedestrian zone, uh, you know, continuing funding for DDOT bus priorities, uh, uh, prioritizing the design and construction of the 18th or of the uh, Columbia Road uh, bike lane and um, allocating funding for Unity Park resurfacing. Uh, implementing things or implementing spaces from the Adams Morgan Vision Framework um, and completing and renovating Ann Hargrove Park, Carolyn Laurent Park, as well as addressing the erosion in Calorama Park. Um, so we discussed a few of those things, uh, or I guess all of those things. Um, <clears throat> continuing on to that, uh, and I guess just opening it up more, uh, discussing more uh, and trying to add more funding to DDOT in general. Um, you know, as we had the conversation with Director Lott, you know, we love working with Cynthia, but there clearly needs to be more Cynthia's at DDOT. Um, so of course, advocating for more folks at DDOT to make sure that, uh, you know, our, their is support for rapid project delivery. Um, additionally, fund, making funds for district-wide multi-use trail network, um, having funds for the repave of Columbia Street uh, or Columbia Road um, to 16th Street Northwest. Uh, additionally, fully funding Vision Zero, uh, implementing um, the Office of Plan as concept for DPR Park, adding money for a cost, um, cost of living adjustments for clean teams, and then uh, adding more funding to the office of ANC to support the uh, Advisory Neighborhood Commission's Participation in Planning Amendment Act of 2019. Um, so those are all things that are listed under like infrastructure and business. Uh, obviously, a lot of those things are very honed into Adams Morgan uh, and our community, but some of them are uh, larger things that do uh, more connect uh, Adams Morgan to the entire community. The next uh, few buckets are related to housing, education, as well as legislative priorities. In the housing budget bucket, we have the Way Home campaign. Uh, this is a $96 million investment to end chronic homelessness. The next is an LGBTQ budget coalition, and this is approximately $4 million dedicated to housing, workforce, and protections for LGBTQ youth and seniors. The next is uh, $25 million to domestic violence specific housing. Um, there was a great presentation last week uh, from this coalition. They really made the case for this investment. Um, and then uh, finally is more reentry advocacy, um, more housing for uh, the uh, returning citizens. Um, and that, it, that ask is sponsored by the reentry advocacy network. Um, the next piece relates to education funding and uh, it relates to uh, increasing the uniform per student funding formula or UPSFF um, to 4%. Uh, the next is to add $60 million to fund subsidy payments for child care centers and operators and uh, reopening, um, which allows parents uh, to work. Uh, the, the next is redirecting money from DPS school security contracts to MPD school safety division initiatives and uh, for positive and uh, safe school uh, cross culture um, across schools. And then finally, the uh, legislative priorities um, relate to the Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing, fully funding the Birth to Three for All Act of 2018, fully funding the Women, Infants, and Child Protect Program Expansion Act, and fully funding the Ombudsman Person for Children. 
Um, the therefore clause does state that in addition to using all of the federal funds, um, that we should also endorse raising revenue, uh, particularly um, by taxing the district's uh, highest earners, and then also continuing to redirect funds from Metropolitan Police Department to make these uh, to make these requests funded. Um, so the uh, mayor did drop her budget last week, uh, as Director Lott stated, and went through a lot of this. Um, I will say a lot of this was funded, like a lot, a lot, a lot of this was funded. So in terms of like wish list, that's great. Um, you know, we got a lot of the things on the wish list. There's uh, definitely a few things that we, uh, you know, we definitely should still send this letter because there's a lot of things we still need to give, uh, you know, our council members support for. And that's really what this letter is about. Uh, we are going to send this letter and uh, the mayor already proposed her budget. Now it's the council's turn. And we essentially, uh, hopefully, will give them courage and or leadership on these issues to um, to close the gaps and or to make the initial funding that uh, the, the uh, that the executive did not do. Um, and that goes anywhere from uh, fully funding Vision Zero to ending cr chronic homelessness um, to increasing the uniform per student funding formula. All of these things were things that the mayor was able to make investments in, but wasn't able to complete the gap. Um, so those are the main idea pitches. Um, if there are any questions, happy to help or try to help answer them. Um, some of these things were added by other ANC commissioners, so I may you know, direct any questions to those folks. Um, but yeah, this is a letter very similar to what council members and other advocacy groups and other ANCs are sending. And um, I think that it's important and timely. And I think that in addition to saying what we should fund, um, we should also say how we should fund it. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bowles. Uh, Commissioner Wood, go ahead. Don't worry, I'll be quick. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just kind of a general comment. Uh, that something like this isn't a requirement for an ANC, but I think it's really useful. One, because of you know requesting money for things that need to be funded, but also you know Japer did a really good job taking lead on this because it's a document that can really serve in the future. So kind of to like go to the point of some of the stuff is already in the mayor's proposed budget. This isn't the only fiscal year. It's we don't exist in a vacuum, and it's important to develop that kind of continuity so that. In the future, you can even refer to documents like this and say, well, this is not something that we just want for a single time injection, depending on the thing, but just to kind of uh, justify recurring expenses. So long winded way of saying great work, Japer. This was uh, really collaborative. You took the lead. And uh, I think that a lot of ANCs were looking to us from around the city to do stuff like this because it's, you know, it's a part of our job to advocate from the constituents to the council, but this is a really succinct way to be able to do so. So we literally have bullet points to point out. So it was fun to be a part of. Okay, uh, Commissioner Boots. Um, first, I just really wanna reiterate um, what an amazing job Commissioner Bowles did on this piece of legislation and uh, Commissioner Gold and Shepardine on the previous legislation. I did have just a general comment when I looked at them both kind of side to side that, that came to me is that um, I'm a little concerned of kind of the amount of asks that we have the amount of bullet points between this piece and the previous legislation. We have over 50 different bullet points of uh, different asks. And I guess I'm concerned um, in the future as we're going forward, how well we're gonna be able to advocate and if we're spreading ourselves too thin and that in, and I don't have any changes for this one and I, I fully support it the way it's written now um, because it's, um, I think we're way too late in the process for it. But as we are going forward, um, especially when we're at the committee process, uh, I think we might think about how we are prioritizing and if we are able to prioritize in a way that we're really um, going to be able to talk about each one of these issues um, that we're going to be able to lend its support to it um, because we do have finite time when we do have the opportunity to advocate for this and when we have so many different things. Um, you know, I, it allows the different departments and things like that to pick and choose what they want to talk about and not as much as what we think is um, kind of the priority on these lists. So 
Um, it's really just something for the future as we kind of move forward. I think we're going to run into this. Um, again, I don't have anything that I would take out of either this piece or the previous legislation, and that's why I support them as written. Um, but I think that is something we should consider, um, especially as we're going through the committee process of making sure that we we are really focused. And if there's things that are very, very important for our, our, our neighborhood and community that we want to shine a very our, our spotlight on, that we're not kind of um, diluting that light um, over too many different priorities, even if they are priorities that are worth supporting. Okay, okay, uh, got it. Um, Commissioner Gold, I see you have your hand up. I, I wanna reiterate everyone's uh, thanks of Commissioner Bowles and the commissioners who, who worked on this. Um, I think that, you know, as shown in the discussion with Acting Director Lott, we have a lot of priorities in our community, um, both for our community and for the district. Um, and I think it is it is great that we are speaking up for them. Um, two, I guess, um, formatting uh, matters. I think I, I recognize this is not Commissioner Bowles's fault that the mayor released her budget days ago, and there's no way that he, as a full-time professional, you know, a part-time ANC commissioner uh, could have gone through uh, her, her budget. Um, but, but I think it would be helpful on these items that it's pointed out that, you know, she did fund them or funded part of them. I think it would be helpful for us to reiterate, hey, good job, um, because we should, we should certainly criticize when there's something to criticize. And, uh, you know, politicians also like to hear that they're doing good things too. So I think it would be helpful to separate both a like a wish list of these are the things we want that weren't touched, but then also a thank you so much for for these priorities. Um, the, the the second thing I would say is that the the resolution of the letter I guess I would recommend that we not end on a therefore and that we simply that what we vote on is a resolution to send this letter. But the letter itself is written as a letter, not as a resolution. And so I think that as opposed to saying, uh, therefore there we request, uh, we would simply say, you know, ANC requests that the, the, the DC council pass the, the uh, above priorities. Um, and then uh, separate, so that would be the, the text of the letter. And then separately, we would just right now, you know, without any whereas or anything else, just have a resolution that says, uh, ANC 1C supports sending this the letter as discussed, and and so to separate and not there not therefore uh, send a letter that sounds like a legislative uh, piece of legislation versus sending sounding like a letter. Um, I'll, I'll just leave that as food for thought there, um, and I, I see that there are other folks who are looking to speak. Uh, thanks, uh, commissioners. Um, so. Am I hearing um, that uh, there's maybe a friendly um, that we could go in and put in, this isn't something we could do tonight to know the text, but I think because it's, um, it's more factual matters uh, that um, the thought is to put what amount has been dedicated to a specific item in the mayor's budget uh, before we send the letter. So we can pass it as is, but then go through the budget. Is that uh, what I just heard from you, Commissioner Gold? Um, I, that may be more homework than I'd like to assign to Commissioner Bowles. <laughs> um, yeah. But, but, but I, I mean, again, I, I don't, going line by line to the budget, um, and saying X amount was already funded versus I, I think that he he might already know and I, I won't speak for him so maybe so he can answer this is which of these have definitely been funded or which of these have been partially funded um, Commissioner Bowles I don't know if, if but maybe more categorical instead mm -hmm. of this much like 18 million just thank you for funding or something at the end of that line or something Commissioner Bowles what do you think about that so I think it's a little superfluous. Um, I don't think it really matters too much, especially because uh, council members still have an opportunity to get, I mean, to 
completely rearrange this money however they wish. So uh, really this letter is not even to say like, you know, thank you mayor for supporting this and like DC council, we need like $13 million. I don't really think this commission should care on how it gets funded, but just that it gets funded. So I don't really want to split it up. I also don't really want to say, like go line item and say, this part was funded, this was not. I have done that in my professional and it took like four hours just to do one specific category. And I don't know what that would do for the council members anyway. Like they, they already know likely how much stuff has been funded. So, um, and if they don't, then a staff member needs to figure it out. That's not our, that's not, that's not me. So that's just personally how I. Got it. So uh, no changes um, to, no friendly changes to the uh, letter. Um, Commissioner Faulkner, go right ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry. I was just going to say that it, we could potentially maybe, I guess, add something at the beginning that just acknowledges some of these programs have been funded or partially funded. However, you know, we would encourage, you know, I, I think a lot of the particularly the legislative priorities at the end, like Vision Zero and the Birth to Three, and a lot of those are not funded at all. Um, I think the Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing isn't. So um, I think just maybe something acknowledging that that we know they know that some of these are already funded, but we don't want them to take away the funding. I think as you know, Commissioner Bowles pointed out, they, they can still move things around. So maybe just a simple line sort of noting that. Commissioner Bowles. Yeah, and I'm, I'm totally fine with adding a line at the beginning. That's something like, thanks for uh, proposing these investments dot 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 we have to do more here's the list of you know things that we want to make sure are fully funded i do i mean we definitely should say something to the effect of like thanks for what you know how she has managed to find funds for a lot of these things i mean it's very difficult to come up with a budget it's not it's not easy and i could accept that as a friendly and or we can like wordsmith that uh, before we send this letter, if we, if I'm fine with accepting intent, and then we can move on because it's almost ten. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, you can work on that text uh, offline, um, Commissioner Wood. Yeah, I'll be really quick just because I think Ben made a good point. I mean, it won't be that long, as weird as it sounds to say out loud. Depending on if things return to a more typical schedule for the budget year to where we're doing next year's, so like thinking that far ahead without thinking too far ahead. Something that I did kind of reflect on during this process is like you were saying, to be have a refined approach to, and we sort of did it here, but this is kind of a work in progress to practice it for future iterations because you could go on and on with budget line item requests and it would be an enormous document that would probably not be worth our time doing, but to kind of have our, just a, a thing to have on the record so we can consider when the time is appropriate if we do this in the future, just kind of say, this is our core areas. And in these core areas, we have some bullet points so that we can kind of have, this is our message for the year, as opposed to having less direction, which is less likely to be uh, effective in the first place. I think we did a decent job of going for this year, but uh, in the future, if that seems like something we want to do, I think it's worth considering, so, yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner Gold. Thanks, Chair. So. Lastly, I would move for us to edit the final paragraph of this to simply say, therefore, ANC 1C requests that the DC Council pass and sign the FY22 budget with the previously referenced budget priorities, period, full stop. I think as Commissioner Bowles pointed out, we're not budget experts and the CMs have full staffs who know, who can think about legislating uh, you know, where to move monies from and legislating uh, the, uh, you know, how to tax the uh, district's uh, wealthiest and how to define who the district's wealthiest are. Um, you know, I, I think that we should be focusing on our budget priorities. And as Commissioner Bowles himself said, you know, let, 
let the council figure out where from where that money comes. So I would like to move for for a vote on that. So um, I'll second that. Um, well, first, uh, and you know, we'll open it up to debate um, and uh, or open the floor for discussion uh, with that second. And um, I'll say that uh, you know that those last couple of um, phrases there at the end to use all available tools as Commissioner Gold mentioned, um, that takes uh, a lot of work, a lot of effort. Um, and it's something that uh, we're not going through line by line to enhance this uh, letter or resolution. Um, and to just throw in something like that in a single few words at the end, I feel doesn't show um, a diligent process and a, um, a process that, you know, when you talk about um, redirecting funds from MPD, throwing that in in just a few words, while not looking at other cities and how other cities are increasing funds for police departments. And we're seeing crime waves in American cities. I mean, uh, if you, you know, Google that really quick, you'll see that Baltimore's increased, uh, you know, a, a, they have a relatively new mayor uh, who had called for a reduction in police department funding. And as mayor, he's actually increased it. Um, you know, cities are seeing crime waves. I think MPD needs the money right now. Uh, you know, you could think about Baltimore, New York, LA, all these places that, uh, police departments are seeing increases in funding. And I think uh, to just call for um, a reduction in funding in this letter or to discuss the tax rate in what doesn't even amount to a sentence uh, is, you know, doesn't show good process on our part. However, having said that, I really like the rest of this letter um, and I really do uh, I'm thankful for the work that's gone into it uh, from Commissioner Bowles, um, but I don't want to send the wrong message and say a lot in, you know, we're already saying a lot, but, uh, but to add those, uh, to put that full stop there, that was proposed by Commissioner Gold, um, I'm completely supportive of that. So there are a couple of hands up and uh, I'll go straight to Commissioner Bowles. Yeah, um, so I, you did bring this up um, and I do hear your um, issues with it. However, um, again, this is a, a messaging piece and um, previously uh, in the last ANC um, term, we passed an ANC resolution that related to Black Lives Matter and divestment from MPD. This simple line, um, is something that we are already doing and that uh, Chairman Allen from the public, um, from the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee is already dedicated to doing. Um, it's not saying getting rid of the entire department. It's saying that, um, you know, it's very, it's a bloated budget and there's much more, uh, much better uh, places to uh, reinvest. Uh, one of the things that uh, Director Lott even mentioned, which is a re, uh, di which is a divestment from MPD, is a uh, investment and in getting rid of traffic, uh, traffic violations and also for um, mental health services. So when I talk about divestment from MPD, that's what that line is, is literally to just chop away at MPD's budget to fund things that actually work and do better. Um, the next part about the federal um, the part about taking all the money on the feds, that's that really hasn't been brought up, but it should be about it too. Um, the mayor was able to make a lot of these investments because there is federal funding for three years. 
So um, she is doing, you know, the best she can here. Um, she is one of the, I would say, one of the executives that has been able to utilize federal funds better than most. But that being said, in two years and in three years, we are going to face a financial cliff. And for some of these programs, they, such as ending homelessness, such as increasing the student pupil uh, formula, there's not going to be funding for this unless we raise revenue. And one of the ways that we can raise revenue is do exactly with what uh, council member Allen proposed last year, which is gonna be a guaranteed proposal this year, which is to raise revenue on the wealthiest to help fund, uh, to help fund these programs. Um, so our council member, council member Brianna Doe has been in favor of this. She was the co-sponsor of it last year. Um, and I definitely believe uh, she made this amendment during the budget. Um, and so uh, to add with everybody else, like this is to a messaging piece and saying that residents and Adams Morgan want to be taxed more to fund these programs um, that are critical and crucial. And we don't have, I'm, I don't, I don't want this to come off as we want to be taxed more so Unity Park can get resurfaced. Yes, I want Unity Park to be resurfaced, but any chronic homelessness is something that we raise taxes over, not Unity Park. There's plenty of money to resurface Unity Park. Raising taxes means ending chronic homelessness, means adding money towards our education formulas. Um, that being said, the mayor without without these revenue services will not close the gaps and neither will the council. So fully funding Vision Zero, you're not going to fully fund Vision Zero unless we tax the wealthiest residents. It's not going to happen. I don't know where that revenue is going to come from. Um, so those are some things we can. I don't want to say this is a wish list. This is These are a lot of things that can and should happen. They are critical needs. There's reasons why they're on this list. Um, and to Ben's point, or to Commissioner Butts's point, there's a reason why they're on this list. If they're not on this list, then one of the commissioners or community members did not request for this to be added. So there wasn't capacity for it to be added to. Um, so there's tons and tons of other requests um, that need to be funded still. These are just the things we have capacity for, and we even realize that there needs to be more revenue. So I don't think that it's gonna be a backhand to the council. Um, I mean, if you all believe um, that, you know, we should split this up, I'm happy to, um, if we need to pass it now, today, right now, to say that we want to tax the wealthy and divest in MPD and use all federal and then send this letter. So I'm happy to split that, those very pieces up um, into two separate resolutions, um, but we need to be sending what we want and how we need to fund it at the same, in the same go. That's how I feel and uh, I, hope, I hope we have the votes to make that happen. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Bowles. Could you just clarify um, uh, the part you're happy to split it up? You mean? Yeah, so I'm happy if we were to have a, we would need to introduce another resolution and add it to the agenda to essentially say, um, we are requesting that the DC council and the mayor uh, divest from NPD and uh, use all of the federal funds on the table and tax the wealthiest residents um, to make a equal or an equitable budget. Um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to split it up, but if that's how you all would want to do it, you know, that's fine with me um, as long as we get both of these messages out the door. I see, okay. Uh, I think I understand that. So, um, hmm. the one thing I'll comment and say that uh, there was uh, some talk about the mayor's uh, budget and her proposal or her budget proposal um, in that she did not raise uh, any taxes. In fact, she cut some fees and things. Uh, she cut the cost of some of these fees. Um, so I'll, I'll get to some questions. Uh, Peter, uh, Commissioner Wood, you, have, you had your hands up first. Yeah, so a couple points. Um, First, I think you mentioned something about Baltimore being an example of how pushing to reduce funding for police departments somehow leads directly to crime. Uh, 
I think I'm obligated as a social scientist to point out that that's not how causation and correlation work, <laughs> but that's not really the point. Uh, really, I mean, I, the first time I read it, and then even the second time I read this, more to what I think Commissioner Cole has said, I kind of read it and thought, okay, I understand how this language seems a little bit, uh, it changes the flow a bit. And then the more I read it, I realized, and did some kind of research into what other ANCs have done and are doing, and commissioners have done, or excuse me, council members have done. Uh, <sighs> The, the, what stinks out to me, especially with this particular budget, and I haven't heard too much about it directly in, in these terms, is how next year is an election year for the mayor, and there's a, it's very advantageous to kind of ride the coattails of getting a lot of federal money for a particular fiscal year and also being able to say, oh, I didn't raise taxes, especially for the people who will probably be funding her campaign. Uh, and I don't know if that's the type of president, president I think that is important to set. That said, uh, I don't think that's our job as an ANC to go into the depths of how to you know, restructure the tax code. With the way I read these you know, lines at the end that seem to be kind of contemptuous or whatever, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a closing point to say, or to reiterate what's already been kind of established, which is that there is pretty widespread support for more equitable, equitable distribution of who carries the brunt of funding public services that are important. And this is just saying of these things that we support, which is, the tip of an iceberg. This is the type of just kind of moral principles that we are have used to guide this document. Like I said, I don't think it's any ANC's place to go and say the tax code needs to be established in this way, and we go through significantly more labor to do that, which would probably be, be ignored anyway. And I, I think that this, uh, yeah. Long story short, I'm kind of reviewing this document several more times. I think that that language is fine. <laughs> okay, Commissioner Boots. Yeah, um, I had more of a, of a question and I guess um, I'm, I'm torn both. I, I definitely see the, the, the pros and cons on both sides of this, um, but maybe maybe Commissioner Gold, you can help me on this, is that I feel like when we were having a discussion about the uh, study in the bike lane, that one of, one of the concerns that I had was just talking about how in the weeds we got about taking out parking spaces, things like that, that was a little bit contentious at the time. And to me, the way that I read this is it's, it, these are things that they may not touch if we don't spell them out and say, we're okay, we want you to look at these different things. And that's kind of how I read it. Um, but I just would kind of like to know how this language is different than kind of what we talked about when we were talking about taking parking spaces out for um, that study in terms of, we just want them to make sure that they're using every available resource that's available to them and looking at things that they may not see as politically tenable um, um, in most cases. Commissioner Boots, that's a really uh, interesting parallel. So thank you for making me think for a second. Um, I would say two things. My immediate thought is that the parking issue is an ANC level issue. Whereas what the marginal tax rates of the residents of the District of Columbia is not. So we, as the determiners, as, as the approvers or deniers of a bike lane that runs through our community, we should be in the weeds of it. I think that I, I, I think that that's what I would say that the difference is on that. And I have other comments that are not as related that I'll, I'll bring up later. Uh, but does that, does that help answer the question or should I think a little more about it? No, I, I, I think that's a good answer. Thanks. Great. Um, thank you both. Uh, there's a, a couple hands up um, in the audience. So we'll take those. Uh, I think the first hand that came up was Alan Roth. Go right ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, you know, when I, when I, you know, on this issue of taxation, when I, when I, when I first read the language, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't necessarily, um, didn't necessarily strike me or offend me uh, badly, um, you know, because I think we'd all say we believe in progressive taxation. Um, but, you know, listening to the discussion, um, and listening to um, 
Commissioner Bowles's description of it. You know, I, I've got I've got a question, um, uh, and it's it's kind of a specific question because you know the the language of the resolution says taxing the district's highest earners, um, and then I heard Commissioner Bowles refer to taxing the wealthiest district residents, and then in another sentence. Um, and I jotted it down here. He said, you know, he wants to send a message to the council that the residents of Adams Morgan want to be taxed more. Well, there are a lot of residents of Adams Morgan of lots of different income levels and lots of different backgrounds. So I, I guess the question I want to put to Commissioner Bowles and maybe to Commissioner Wood, uh, because he's supportive of this language too, is, what is your definition in this resolution of the district's highest earners? What what what's your what's your price point? Like what is your what is your what do you mean when you say the district's highest earners? Yeah, so I believe there are two proposals. Uh, one that relates to earners of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars of annual income and another is a $400,000 of annual income. And honestly, either of those seem like they could uh, afford an increase in taxes, especially considering what the city would get back uh, in return for it. Well, what, what is that amount? I mean, uh, you know, the, this discussion of- 250,000 I mean, and 400,000. No, 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 that, that's not what I'm asking. What I'm, you said the residents of Adams Morgan want to be taxed more. I, like, you know, <laughs> that those amounts are not going to affect me one way or the other. I'm, you know, my income is basically a government pension. <laughs> so I'm not worried about that. But when you say the, the residents of Adams Morgan want to be taxed more, um, the, 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 I haven't seen any figures that show what the total revenue to the District of Columbia is going to be from taxing people in that income and in those income brackets. And I got to believe that it is a relatively small amount of money as compared to um, uh, the amount of money needed to fund all of the initiatives that need to be funded. To, to meet all of the desire, you know, not, not just these wishes, but all so, of the wishes that, that people have. Yeah, so I would point you to uh, Council Member Allen's uh, proposal from last year. It actually did generate quite a bit of revenue. I believe it was in like the 100, $125 million uh, of recurring funds range. Um, so that's, of course, so that's, so that's, so that's one, that's one quarter. That's one quarter of just the mayor's proposal for the Housing Production Trust Fund and nothing else. Um, I mean, we're having an argument here about an, what sounds in, in gross numbers like a lot of money off the top of your head, but in point of fact, it's an argument about a relatively small amount of money relative to the totality of the district budget. Yeah, so let's do it. Well, why? To, to make, just to make a point? To, uh, to end chronic homelessness. Well, in, so, no, 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 I think, I, think, I think the bigger point is that you're trying to make a point of saying, tax the district's highest earners, the wealthiest people, and then you turn around and say, the residents of Adams Morgan wanna be taxed more. I can tell you the, the vast majority of the residents of Adams Morgan do not make over $250,000. You're right. I think that uh, median income is around 110 in Adams Morgan. So it definitely would not um, hit most folks, but yeah, I believe that um, at least based on the chat, folks do, um, do want to pay more taxes to get more services. And Chair, is this a free-for-all or is this going to be moderated? Yeah, this is, uh, uh, you know, we've, it has been moderated and people are asking questions and we're taking questions, so. Uh, 
Alan, is there a follow up? I heard. No, I, 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 you know, that, it's, I think the, the one follow up I'd make is the, 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 the thing that I found, I, it, it's a great resolution. The thing that I found interesting was in, in Director Lott's presentation, he mentioned $59 million being proposed for the Adams Educational Campus, which is in this ANC. And I'm not aware that anybody in the ANC was previously made aware of it, but it appears nowhere in this resolution. For all I know, it's a pet project of Council Member Nadeau. I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but I can't imagine that she's not aware of it. I don't know anything about it. I don't know whether it's important to her or to the ANC or to parents who send their kids to Adams or not. But um, I would think that if it doesn't appear in ANC 1C's resolution, um, that looks kind of weird. Um, but on the other hand, I can't suggest putting it in there if I don't know whether neighbors or, or constituents of the ANC want it or not. So it's kind of interesting to me that there was no communication or little communication with the ANC about a $59 million project to improve the Adams School. So um, anyway, that's it. I, 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 I would just, I would say, focus on the things that you need for the neighborhood and, and not on making um, big messaging talking points about stuff that amounts to um, amount to very little in the end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alan. And um, just uh, a quick point on the, um, on the Adams uh, resolution. I had uh, written something um, about two years ago uh, asking for requesting an assessment and modernization of Adams. And uh, uh, and we worked with uh, the Councilmember Nadeau's office. We did a tour uh, along with the um, parent teacher organization there. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that this came through. And I agree that it's a little odd that it wasn't sort of flagged for us in advance, but uh, it is something that uh, this ANC passed um, in spring of 2019. Um, and I think the amounts that we were requesting back then or the amounts that we were talking about were around uh, 60 million bucks. Um, so uh, moving to um, other questions, um, Jesse Rabinowitz. Hey y'all, it's so good to be with you. My name is Jesse uh, and I live at 2412 17th Street and Japer is my ANC commissioner. I just wanted to thank Japer for all this work um, he's doing tonight. Um, I do work at Miriam's Kitchen and manage our policy and budget advocacy. So my life pretty much consists of thinking about DC's budget, um, especially when we think about taxation and ending homelessness. And I wanted to just point out a few things about this proposal that I think are really important. Um, we're asking people making more than $200,000 a year to pay the cost of about three lattes a month. Um, to me, that doesn't seem like a lot. When we look at those making $200,000 a year or more, 90% of those people are actually making more than a million dollars a year. So the idea that millionaires can't afford a few cups of coffee a month is mind boggling to me. Um, and we also know that in DC, most of those people who are earning that much money are white. And that is a direct result of how racialized capitalism operates and how the tax policy um, privileges wealth and home ownership. As a homeowner myself, my spouse and I make nowhere near, you know, $200,000 as individuals or $400,000 as a household. And we would still be more than willing to pay $10 more a month in taxes if it meant ending homelessness. Um, the argument that $100 million isn't that much, so we shouldn't do it, um, I think is honestly a little befuddling to me. Um, as Japer mentioned, the mayor's budget relies really heavily on federal funding, 
which is going to run out. So uh, in three or four years, we're going to need to pick up lots of investments locally. And the only way we can do that is by um, using local funding um, and local taxes, like the this tax on high wealth individuals would be a recurring funding source of local funding that could be used to end homelessness. $100 million would actually end long-term homelessness for 3,100 people, which I don't think is an insignificant number of people. Um, and just in closing, um, we're talking about a money that's generated uh, from people who are rich, like $200,000 a year for an individual is rich, um, going to help people who are literally living outside and on you know, zero to very little dollars a month. Um, to me, we moved to Adams Morgan because it's a community that cares about our neighbors and cares about justice and wants everyone to be treated equitably. We can't do that unless we think about how we're spending our taxes. Um, and we can't do that unless we um, are willing to pay our fair share in taxes. Um, and I think, you know, three, three, cups, three cups of coffee a month is a very fair price to pay for ensuring that all of our neighbors have the housing that they need to thrive. Um, I'm clearly passionate about this and happy to also talk offline if people have more questions about the, like the wonkiness of the tax proposal or what it would be used for. But I really, really hope that this ANC passes this uh, resolution to support, um, you know, helping our neighbors who need the help the most. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so it seems like everyone has spoken, so I'll go back around um, to those uh, that have had their hands up. So um, Commissioner Wood, you had your hand up. Yeah, just because uh, I believe Mr. Roth called my name out. I mean, I, I agree that the language to say Adams Morgan as some sort of like coherent unit wants to be taxed, but I do know that there are constituents of mine and others who have to make quite a bit more money than I do, <laughs> which isn't to say a lot. Uh, that you know, say they do want a progressive tax system, that they do want to, uh, in many cases, be taxed more themselves. But I also think it's, I think it could be better wording maybe, probably not necessary for this because it's a pretty trivial line that's not really the focus of the document. But to kind of say, this is, you know, like Commissioner Bowles pointed out, statistically one of the wealthier ANCs in the District of Columbia. And as a whole, there has been pretty well-documented support for people saying that as a person has more income and more wealth, that a progressive tax code and really a progressive society would prioritize divesting those resources to the system often made of unpaid labor that allowed that person to, to flourish in the first place. But uh, yeah, I'll just, I have other thoughts. I don't know if this is even really the appropriate form anymore, but it's been an interesting discussion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Wood. Um, another thing I'll, I'll just reiterate that uh, Mayor Bowser's budget, which is called the Fair Shot Budget, uh, she did not increase taxes. I mean, she obviously had it at her disposal to propose an increase in taxes, and she did not. And when it, going back to the other item uh, that's listed in that final sentence uh, about moving funds away from NPD, um, you know, there are, uh, Commissioner Bowles had mentioned that uh, we had passed a resolution about a year ago um, asking to move funds away from NPD. You know, I'll, I'll point out that so did the mayor of LA, so did they did the same in New York, they did the same in Baltimore, and this year they're increasing funding for their police departments. So I don't think uh, it's the right move, um, but more uh, to uh, uh, come on to Commissioner Wood's comment, um, I think that the resolution is uh, otherwise great and would like to, uh, and I agree, uh, at, with ending, adding a full stop as was proposed. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Gold, go right ahead. Thank you, Chair. I think this is my closing argument. And then, um, uh, you know, we obviously there are other people who, that want to speak, but my, my closing argument is that two weeks ago, when we reviewed this in PZT, I raised concerns that, this, that the language in this paragraph was not did not appear to be as well thought out as the rest of the resolution. Um, and that has not changed in the two weeks since, uh, either through uh, our um, 
uh, committee or uh, or through the PSE committee, where, which reviewed this um, letter. I think that 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 challenge with the lack of thought throughness has come uh, has has arisen in this very meeting when four different people have interpreted four different ways for what the term uh, including ta by taxing the district's highest earners means. I fully agree that we need to raise revenue and I think that we should have a much longer discussion and more thorough discussion about raising revenue. I don't think uh, that this is the proper venue for it. I think that I, I thank uh, Jesse Rabinowitz for starting an email campaign telling the council, uh, telling the commission to approve a resolution to increase taxes, because without that, I didn't know we had a resolution in front of us to increase taxes. Um, as that a neighbor pointed out, uh, right, the that federal funding will run out in three to four years time. And therefore we have three to four years to craft a well thought out resolution about our thoughts on, ra on raising revenue. Uh, but again, I don't think that, I, I, I did not think, and I still do not think, and I uh, hope others agree that this is not the appropriate venue for the uh, remainder of this paragraph. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Gold. Uh, we have a couple more hands up, uh, Alan Roth, and then we'll uh, go back to Commissioner Bowles. Thank you. Um, I, I, I just wanna be clear about something because I, I, I don't want anyone to think that I was trivi trivializing the $100 million that was being spoken about before. And I don't, I don't want anyone thinking that I'm trivializing or opposing the idea that the district should raise more revenue. The question that I'm raising is this, and, and uh, I think Mr. Rabinowitz um, alluded to it um, uh, in his comments, um, but there is a difference between income and wealth. Those are two different things. The fact that somebody may make a lot of money in a given year is not the same thing as somebody being rich. The district raises an equal amount of money from property taxes as they do from income taxes, for example. But the district has the lowest property tax rate for residential property of any of the jurisdictions that surround us. Maybe a better approach to taxing wealth would be to raise the district's residential property tax rate. Maybe another approach would be to have the Office of Tax and Revenue do a better job or a different job of collecting property taxes or assessing property tax, uh, assessing property values more appropriately. Maybe the guy who lives next door to me shouldn't have been collecting a homestead deduction for the last 20 or more years since I've lived in my house, while at the same time, He's living with his wife in a condo three blocks away. I don't know how many other people in the district are collecting two homestead deductions. Maybe the, the District of Columbia Council should not be handing out tax incentives and tax abatements to developers and other business interests like candy in the way they've been doing for the last several years. There are all sorts of ways to raise revenue. And there are all sorts of ways to raise revenue from people who are wealthy. This is not necessarily the only way to do it. So I think Commissioner Gold has put his finger on, uh, on the problem here, which is, and I think to some extent, Commissioner Wood alluded to it by saying that it may not, that this language may not be particularly well worded, and, and although it may seem trivial in the context of this resolution, you're being asked to go on record here, voting for some specific language. You've got a great set of recommendations here, but you've thrown in one 
particular way of going about raising revenue that isn't well thought out because there are a whole panoply of different options for doing that, that yes, can get at rich people. And by rich people, I mean wealthy people, but this is not necessarily the best or only way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and so, uh, Commissioner Bowles, um, the last hand raised there. Yeah, so um, I, um, I don't think this was the intent, but I do think that it is kind of offensive to say that this uh, last piece was not well thought out. Um, and I pose this to you. What else would you want me to uh, offer? Do you want me to break out tax code? Do you want me to specifically bring up the entire MPD budget and say, this is where I want redirected? Do you want me to go through the American Recovery Plan Act and say, these are all the federal dollars, please make sure to take all these federal dollars? Because I could have done, I mean, I've seen Commissioner Gold's previous uh, resolution on Move DC, and that was way too thorough. That is not happening in this letter. Coalitions and council members send two and three page letters. It is to state their moral beliefs, to say, this is what we should fund, we should do this. There's plenty of data to back up why we should be taxing people who make over $200,000 a year and families of over $400,000 a year. It's been vetted, it, vetted, it was vetted last year and it barely failed the council. I anticipate it passing th this year. Um, I, I just don't think that I, I think it's shenanigans. <laughs> we need to pass this. Um, we have the opportunity to do this. We have the opportunity to give our leaders even more courage to do this, to fund things that we need from Unity Park Repave to ending homelessness. Um, so thanks for your time. It's 1036. Um, and I look forward to, um, I can we move, can I call the question or call the question on yeah. Yeah. the proposal? Um, we just have one, uh, looks like a response there to uh, Commissioner Gold. Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, apologize if my phrasing made it seem that I was personally attacking a member of this commission. Um, I, I, again, on the whole, this is a very well written um, and very well researched document. Um, I think that my concern was about the uh, specificity of, of the language in the final paragraph. and. Uh, so I, I apologize if that, was, uh, if that was taken as offense by Commissioner Bowles or, or, or anyone else. It was, not, it was not my intention. Understood. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to uh, call to a vote um, on the, uh, and what we have in front of us is just to be clear, um, it is um, to, it's an amendment to the letter um, and uh, what the specific amendment is, is to modify that last paragraph so that it says, do you keep the therefore there, Commissioner Gold? Uh, we, we never came to resolution of whether or not we would have a re an approval resolution of the letter. So I think at this point, we'll just keep the therefore uh, as is. So, um, we would uh, put a period where it says, put a full stop instead of the first comma, we put a period. So it would read, therefore ANC1C request that the DC council pass and sign the FY22 budget with the previously referenced budget priorities. And that's period there, right. Um, and then strike the rest of that. Um, so the uh, the motion in front of you, commissioners, um, is to um, is as I just described it to put a period uh, right after the word priorities and not change any uh, of the rest of the resolution. So, and that would modify the resolution. And the reason why we're voting on this is because it wasn't accepted uh, as a friendly. Um, so, uh, we call this to a vote, and uh, I'd like to. Do a roll call on this one. 
So I will start. Um, Our point of order is are we're voting yay if we accept the change and nay if we want the original language. Correct. Yep. Yay if you accept the change and uh, nay uh, if you do not accept the change. Commissioner Gold. Okay, it's a, it seems frozen uh, right at the moment of vote. Yay. Did you uh, hear me? Uh, no. Okay, I voted yay. Yes. Okay, okay. So um, we'll do a roll call uh, and I'll just go uh, through, um, we'll start at the top and come down sequentially. So, uh, Commissioner Clem, uh, do you vote in favor of the change? Vote yes, against the change, no, or abstain? Um, I vote yes. Uh, Commissioner Bowles, in favor or against? No, against the change. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Boots. Well, yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Faulkner. No. Um, Commissioner Wood. No. And myself, I vote in favor of the change. So that's four to three. Uh, the amendment passes. Um, so now the resolution before you, uh, commissioners, reads uh, as it was described. It has a period at the end of the word priorities. Um, if there's no discussion, I'll call to a vote on that resolution. All those in favor of the resolution, uh, of the amended resolution, uh, say aye. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? Okay. Eight zero. Um, fantastic. Seven zero. Sorry. Oh, seven, yes, seven zero. Yes, we miss uh, Commissioner Carano. <laughs> um, More than you know. <laughs> um, so I don't know if she misses us at ten forty at night. Yeah, <laughs> we had two items on the agenda, but it was our longest meeting of the year. Um, we had a lot of uh, good discussion and. Um, you know, I, I thank you guys for sticking with it for the long haul. And thanks everyone for the good work.